When I was 14, my high school thought it would be a good idea to take a bunch of us New York City kids into the Catskills for a day. The idea was to introduce us to nature since some of us had spent our entire lives living in the concrete jungle that is New York City. Seriously, a lot of us had only ever seen forests and farms on the TV or in movies and now that I'm older, I realize how potentially damaging that is. I honestly feel like human beings are supposed to be in contact with nature, that it makes us happier, healthier and gives us a sense of place. But I'll quit my rambling and get on with the story. So one super early morning, we load onto our school bus for the drive out into the Catskills. This is in like November too, so it was still dark when I got up and the sun had barely risen when the driver got us on the road. I was excited at the time. I had aspirations to be in the military and the idea of getting to wander around the woods was such a cool concept to me at the time. In the end, it actually turned out to be pretty boring and really tiring. We walked for hours and hours with our teacher telling us about different kinds of trees, animals, and weather systems that the area was home to, but we didn't even really get to see any of those animals aside from the odd squirrel that was squirreling away nuts. It turns out some of them don't hibernate at all, unlike a lot of woodland creatures. Like I said, it was all much more boring than I first thought. That was, right up until I saw something carved into a tree. It was carved in really deep, obviously with some kind of knife or something, right through the bark and into the wood. I'd never seen anything like it before, and it wasn't like I wasn't a smart kid. I used to read about different religions and occult stuff quite a lot, so I was pretty confused as to what it was. To describe it, it looked like a rough figure eight, but with like dots and lines carved around it in certain places, so that it kind of looked like an octopus, only not at all at the same time. I know that makes literally zero sense and I wish this was when camera phones were a thing because I'd probably still have the pictures with me to link people to. Out of curiosity, I call my teacher over and ask her if she recognized it. She gives the thing pretty much the same look as I figured I had, just having no idea what she's looking at, then obviously tells me no, that she's never seen anything like it before but that in all likelihood it's something a hunter carved into the trees so they wouldn't get lost. I would not really heard of anyone doing that before, but I kind of figured she knew best, so I dropped the whole thing and just followed the group as we walked on. After a little while, we ended up walking right to the edge of a cliff face near a mountain. It was this huge wall of rock that just seemed to rise up out of the earth, covered in moss and stuff. Our teacher starts pointing at the rock and telling us how we can tell how old it is by the different kinds of rock that the thing was made up of, but few of us were really listening. I only really started paying attention myself as we walked along the cliff face and I saw something familiar on it, something big too. It was the same symbol we'd seen carved into the tree, only like I said, this one was much, much bigger. Again, I showed our teacher, only this time, she didn't seem so calmly curious, and she seemed as freaked out as I did. Not only that, but the entire class saw it this time, but with it being the first time seeing it, they weren't nearly as scared, just the same curious I was. I asked the teacher quietly who might carve something like that into the rock, who might have the time or the skills or the equipment. She just told me she didn't know, but not to mention the ones that we'd seen carved into the trees. Plural. She used the plural, and it honestly scared me more than it should have. I'd only seen the one carved into the tree, but she'd obviously seen a lot more than I had. I just found myself hoping we'd be heading back soon. It was early afternoon by that time, and I wondered just how scary the woods would be after dark. Thankfully, I started heading back towards the bus not long after eating lunch. A little while into our walk, one kid stops the teacher and tells her he needs to go to the bathroom. It wasn't an ideal situation by any means, but with the kid being a dude, it was pretty easy to remedy. Teacher just tells him to go into the bushes nearby and deal with it, so he does. A few minutes later, we hear him tearing through the bushes back towards us, panting as he ran. He emerges with this terrified look in his eyes, like I've never seen anyone so scared before, not in real life. The teacher runs over and starts asking him what the deal is, but he can hardly get his words out. 
He just keeps breathing real fast, in and out, like rocking back and forth on the spot like he was losing his mind. The teacher is telling him to breathe, calm down and focus, and tell us what he saw. What he said shook our group to the core. There was a man, a real old man, or not so old, he had white hair and a beard, and and he, he didn't have any clothes on, but he was covered in like... Tattoos. Oh my god. Oh god, what if he saw me? What if he's following us? The teacher had to quiet the kid before a full-blown panic attack took over the group, and we hurried back to the bus without stopping to look at anything at all. Nothing else happened on the walk back to the bus, but thank god. But I remember being really curious as to what the kid thought he saw when he went to the bathroom, and I foolishly asked. He told me exactly the same thing, only went into a little more detail about the tattoos and stuff. I asked him if he remembered what they looked like, to draw one of them if he could. He took out a notebook and pen, closed his eyes for a moment so he could really recall, then he drew something rough that I couldn't quite make out at first, but when he showed it, it was clear. It was a bunch of dots and lines, with a clear figure eight in the middle. For a good few years, I was a teacher at Lansdowne Middle School in Victoria, British Columbia. I loved my job. Teaching wasn't something I'd never really seen myself doing. It certainly wasn't a career I'd talked about with high school guidance counselors. I kind of fell into it by accident. Long story short, I couldn't get into the college I wanted to, so I had to basically choose between that and nursing, so I chose the one with less blood and guts involved. Every year we take a bunch of grade 8 students up to a place called Camp Barnard at Otter Point, just west of Souk. It's a scout camp built on land gifted by Senator George Henry Barnard, who was a prominent advocate of hunting and outdoor activities in general. There are a lot of fun things for the kids to get up to up at the camp, there's a playing field, a nature trail, a swimming pool, a lake for canoeing and paddleboarding, even an archery range and disc golf course. The kids absolutely adore heading up there for a few days, and there's always a palpable feeling of excitement every year in the run-up to the field trip up there. And I'd be lying if I said I didn't look forward to it too. That kind of stuff really brings out the big kid in me, you know? It was the last week of the school year when we piled onto a bus and drove over to the camp to begin our few days of fun. The weather is normally pretty peachy during that time of year, but last year, there were some unusually strong winds blowing through the camp. This was very disappointing, as it meant that some of the activities would be totally out of the question. You can't play disc golf when the winds can effectively blow your disc right off the entire course, and neither can you paddleboard when your board keeps getting flipped over by choppy waters. That only really left a handful of activities open to the kids, one of which was archery, the other was orienteering. I'll be honest, I was excited to try archery again. I'd tried it the year before the first time, and I'd actually fought to get assigned to it again since I'd just found the whole thing so cool. I had my reservations about the wind, but... They were purely minor concerns about it affecting the kids' accuracy. It'd really suck if a few of the more talented archers were unable to nail a bullseye or two thanks to the winds. But these were thin, polycarbon projectiles. I doubted the wind would have any serious effect on them. But it wasn't the wind I had to worry about. You see, we had this one kid with us who was a real klutz. They sucked at sports... Always seemed to be that kid who ended up in the nurse's office from falling in the schoolyard. Everybody knows a kid like that, right? And this was our clumsy kid. So the kid, who I won't name to protect their future reputations, steps up to the firing line with their bow and arrow in hand, fires off a couple of terrible shots, but I'm quick to offer encouragement. The instructor even takes a little more time to show him the correct stance, had a stand just right so that the arrow flies straight and true towards its target. But when the kid tries to imitate the instructor, he takes up the goofiest pose I think I'd ever seen. Body turned sideways, legs spread way too far apart, 
and they even instinctually squatted down as if to try to lower their center of gravity, as if that was going to help in the slightest. Then, just before they're about to shoot off another arrow, this huge, and I mean huge, gust of wind starts tearing its way through the camp, and I watched in horror as the kid began to sway, falling backwards, and shooting his arrow way off target. The instructor kept his cool, managed to keep the kids from freaking out, but immediately shot me a look as if to say, time to call it a day. Next came the orienteering, about the only truly safe thing to do during this kind of weather. At least, that's what I thought anyway. Sure, the maps were flapping away in our hands as we tried to navigate our way around the course, but it was still pretty fun despite the weather. Fun, right up until I heard a crashing sound coming from just over a rise. The kids I was supervising looked around in confusion, their eyes full of fear as they wondered aloud what the sound was. I told them I wasn't sure, and we'd have to wait to check it out once the course had been completed. But that was a lie. I knew. I knew well what it was. I'd heard it before. It was the sound of a tree falling in the woods. It's frankly unmistakable. A deep, wrenching sound then the clacking of the lumber hitting other upright trees before the final crash as it hits the dirt. I had this horrible feeling in my gut. There were kids all over the area, all taking part in the orienteering exercise in small groups, each overseen by a member of the camp or teaching staff, and it was probably the worst moment of my life so far to realize that my worst fears had come true. I saw a kid bounding over the rise, his eyes, these big, white circles beaming out from his terrified face. I called after him, trying to get him to tell me what had just happened, and he didn't say anything. He just sprinted back towards camp as fast as his little legs could carry him. I tried to keep the kids from worrying too much, but they couldn't concentrate on the task at hand. They seemed to know something was horribly wrong, just as clearly as I did. So, after a few more minutes of trying to control the situation, I just walked us all back to camp to try to get them settled in their bunks. I'll just cut to the chase at this point. The fallen tree had landed right on one of the kids, who I won't name to protect their family. And, believe it or not, he was dead just moments later from massive chest trauma and asphyxiation. The school district's critical incident response team was deployed on the Wednesday afternoon to support students, staff, and families. But with the yearly graduation ceremony that was only a week away, it was completely ruined for a lot of families, and even those that attended felt a sense of pervading sorrow and loss. And as for me, I've never really gotten over the fact that such horrifically random tragedies can occur to completely innocent children. I took advantage of the free counseling services provided by the school district, but they just didn't seem to help. I found myself looking at kids, wondering what completely random accident would take their lives before they even blossomed into fully grown adults. This happened when I was in the fifth grade. I was in a science class and one day we all took a field trip to a science museum. It had a bunch of exhibits and things like that. I really wasn't much of a science fan, but I will admit that I always liked going to the museum because it was pretty fun. We left school and drove down to the museum which was about 30 minutes away. Once we got there, we did the usual stuff. We were able to kind of split up as a group as long as we made it back. I went with a few of my friends in the class from one spot to another. Eventually, it was time to get lunch, and then we would leave shortly after that. Our teacher went around letting everyone know we would be leaving in 10 minutes and to meet back at the entrance. I had seen everything I was going to see, so I decided to just go back and get on the bus. That, that way, I could play some games on my phone until we were going to leave. I left the building into the back parking lot where our bus had dropped us off. I got out there and saw a couple of buses. I started to walk over and saw the bus driver wave me over to him. I got on the bus, but as I did, the bus driver stopped me. He told me there would be no phones on the way back. I was pretty upset to hear this, and I didn't understand why, but I gave him my phone and then sat down. The bus driver then started the engine. I looked out the window and tried to think of why we weren't allowed to have our phones. 
Sure, sometimes the kids would get out of control with them, but I found this a little bit unreasonable. Just then, I felt the bus start to move. I looked and saw the driver was driving out of the parking lot and down to the street. I called out that the rest of the class was still inside, but he ignored me. Then I got a terrible feeling. I asked him to stop the bus and go back, but he just turned around and yelled at me to shut up. The bus was driving down the street and headed for the freeway. All I could do was look out the window and wonder what exactly was going on. I wished that I hadn't gone to the bus by myself and went back with the rest of the group. The bus driver merged onto the freeway and we started going at a fairly high speed. The longer we drove, the more scared that I got. Now I knew the real reason he had taken my phone from me. We continued down the freeway for I would say about five minutes. Suddenly, I heard the noise of a police siren. I looked behind me and saw a flashing light. The bus started to move to the side of the road and I saw a police car go with it. That was one of the greatest feelings in my life. The bus driver then opened the door and took off running into the field beside the road. I saw several police officers run after him and another run to the bus. They were able to get me back to safety and the bus driver was caught a short time later. Back when I was a kid, we took a school field trip to the zoo one time. My school was really small and basically the entire place went. It took us over an hour to get there, but when we were there, it was a day long event, which was nice for us because we didn't actually have to do any schoolwork. I think I was like eight years old and I was one of the younger people there. The first part of the day we spent looking for a bunch of animals, then we got food. After that, we started looking more at plants and things like that. I was more into the animals, so my friend Matt and I went back over to them. We first got back to the exhibit of sea lions. And when we got there, one of the zoo workers asked us if we wanted to help feed the animals. Of course we said yes, cause as an eight year old kid, it seemed like something super fun to do. He told us to follow him and then led us into a doorway and down a dark and quiet hall. It was really weird to be in the back of an exhibit, but it got me really excited to feed the animals. We followed the guy deeper in and into a storage type of room that was even darker. He said this is where they kept the food. He told us to wait there for a second and left the room. Then we saw the door shut and heard it lock. We immediately knew something was wrong. I went to the door and tried to open it, but it was in fact locked. It was a really strong and thick door and neither of us would be able to break it. We banged on it, but I don't know how anyone else outside would be able to hear. After a while of that with no response, we decided to examine the room. It was very dark with no apparent lights and we could barely see. It was probably just about 15 feet by 10 feet and I had basically just junk laying around. It just seemed to be another storage closet. We waited and waited, but of course, the guy never came back, and nobody else did either. This was kind of a long time ago, and neither of us had cell phones we could take out to call anyone or anything like that. We just waited in the dark room for what felt like forever. Occasionally, we would yell or bang on the door, but nothing would ever happen. We did this for literally hours. At one point, we stopped and actually fell asleep on the floor for some time. Eventually, we got back up and went back to banging on the door and yelling. At last, finally, we could barely hear someone from the other side. We both yelled as loud as we possibly could. The door tried to open, but was still locked. Then whoever was there went away. We got really disappointed and thought that was it, until a few minutes later, we saw the door open. There was another zoo worker and she asked us how we had gotten in there. We told her the story and she seemed really surprised. By that time, we saw that the sun was almost set when we got back into the zoo. By that time, we saw that the sun had almost set when we got back into the zoo. Apparently, everyone had been looking for us for over two hours. We were able to get back home later that day, but the guy that worked there and locked us in had left and nobody could find him. It turns out he was caught a while later and had been addicted to some drugs or something like that. They said he had been acting really strange lately. I really don't know why he locked us in there, but we were very lucky to get out because that closet wasn't really used by the zoo anymore.
This story happened many years ago when I was a boy. I was probably about nine or ten, and I remember for class we went on a field trip to one of the state parks. It was just a field trip where we were going to walk around and look at the sights and the wildlife. We went on these trips about four times a year, and it was always pretty fun. On this day, we went to a park that had a bunch of hills and different types of trees. We were going to walk on a path all around it. There was about 20 of us in the class, and after we all got to the park, our teacher told us to follow him and then led us down the path. I was with my best friend Daryl, and we were talking during the walk. At one point, we saw a cool-looking mushroom a little bit off the path, so we stayed back to look at it. The rest of the class was going uphill, and before we knew it, they were out of sight. We went to run to catch back up with them, but we heard a noise coming from behind a tree off the path. I expected to see an animal, but when we looked, there was a boy there around our age. He had a red shirt and jeans, and he was hiding behind the tree. He wasn't in our class. We asked him who he was, but he didn't answer. We thought maybe he was with another school field trip over here or something like that. Daryl asked him if he was on a field trip, and the boy stepped out from the tree and said, No, Daryl. Daryl was really surprised that the kid knew his name, and he asked him how he knew. The boy then looked at me and said my name. It was a little strange, this whole thing, and we said we should all go back with our groups. The boy then went back behind the tree. He was definitely sketchy, but we told him he should come with us because we figured he wasn't supposed to be off the path by himself out here. He didn't come out from behind the tree though, so me and Daryl walked over to him. But when we got behind the tree, the boy wasn't there. It was as if he just vanished into thin air and was gone. Daryl and I looked around for a bit, but then we knew we had to get back to our group, so we ran back. We told our teacher about it, and I know we ended up telling people who worked at the park about the kid, but I never heard anything about it after that. Daryl and I still talk about it sometimes to this day. This happened a while ago. I have since been diagnosed with PTSD because of this incident. I'm currently on medication to suppress the reoccurring nightmares. For some background, at the time I was only 9 years old. I am a female from Georgia. My mother met my stepfather at a church we recently started attending with her best friend. When this happened, they were just dating. It was a fairly normal church for the most part. It was a somewhat run-down building, with an outdated interior and an old basement. The pastor was an ex-drug addict turned man of God, who was honestly one of the nicest people I've ever met. It was a cold winter night. Saturday church service had just ended. We left the church and headed towards my mom's old Pontiac vibe. It was the kind of car that didn't have electric locks or windows. Each door had to be locked and unlocked on its own. We sat in the parking lot talking for some time. Since my stepfather lived in a different city back then, he and my mom wanted to maximize their time together. They were discussing upcoming holiday plans when I noticed a figure wearing a green coat moving between the cars parked nearby. I didn't think anything of it at the time, as it could have been our pastor or another churchgoer. My stepdad got into the passenger seat and we were about to take off when his door was suddenly pulled open. There was a man in a green hoodie that none of us recognized. He had dark skin, bloodshot eyes, and a shaved head. He looked completely deranged. He shoved a gun into my stepdad's abdomen. Give me your wallet, he demanded. Mind you, my stepfather is a Hispanic man. He speaks English well now, but he wasn't fluent back then, and he had a thick accent so he simply responded to the man. No. My mom began freaking out. I was so scared that I kept trying to get out of the car. I started crying because my mom told me to stay put. Then the man began screaming. I said give me your wallet! But my stepdad stood firm. No. The man then directed his attention at my mother. Tell him I said to give me his wallet! Thinking that he couldn't understand him, my mother tried to get my stepdad to comply, but he refused. I'm looking frantically through our fogged up windows, trying to find someone to get their attention. But the man looked at me, then back to my mom. He then hit my stepdad with his gun, causing him to lean forward. 
He then pointed the gun at me. A nine-year-old girl in a pink and black dress who was talking about Christmas dinner just five minutes before. Somebody better give me something or she dies. I lost it. I got out of my seat and exited the car. That's when I saw two other hooded men across the parking lot. They were walking towards the car, also carrying guns. I started screaming and immediately got back in the car. My mom yelled at me for getting out, and the man with the gun was still screaming at my stepdad. Are you listening to me, man? I'm going to shoot her right between the fucking eyes! My mom then offered him all the cash she had on her. She handed him $75 from her wallet. The man ripped away the cash from her, then assaulted my stepdad again with his gun. The mugger then slammed his arm against the car door to close it, but in the process the gun went off. The bullet went into the well of my mom's car. The three men ran off into the night. We sat there crying and trying to console each other. After about 30 minutes, we calmed ourselves down and left. We immediately went to the police station and filed a report. They said it was most likely gang activity and it would be very difficult to track down the perpetrators. The men could have killed my stepfather right in front of my mother. There was no justice. I was only a child when this happened. It's been 13 years and I still wake up screaming and sweating from the nightmares. I'm just glad that my mom had her grocery money on her that day. Heaven knows what would have happened if she didn't. So for context, I'm a 22 year old male and I live in a large city in the Midwest. Now I drive for Lyft while putting myself through trade school. I also drive for other similar companies, but that's besides the point. I have many, many horror stories from those as well, but I'll tell those another time. It was Christmas Eve 2020. I was out driving for Lyft for a few hours before heading to my mom's with my new baby and wife. Nothing really special going on for the night, just the usual. I get a ride request. It happened to be a pickup from this kind of lower income apartment complex. No big deal. I arrive, find my passenger, and he has all of his belongings with him. Like several boxes of stuff. Now, my car is a 2006 Chevy Impala, so it's not really too big. We get all of his stuff loaded up, barely, and we're on our way. Now, during the ride, the guy was crying and saying that his girlfriend was cheating on him and he had apparently walked in on them earlier that night. He couldn't stay there because her name was on the lease, so I was taking him to a hotel. Now in my city, we happen to have a street that is pretty well known for having vices. Hookers, drugs, gangs, weapons, and shady motels. You know, the works. We get to the motel and he asked me to wait for him to check in and get his key. No problem, man. I say, I'll confess, I break the rules a little when it comes to lift. I have a gun hidden in a concealed holster, secured to the underside of my driver's seat for protection. Reason being, driving lift and other contract apps, I've had knives and guns pulled on me, as well as having people trying to fight me, rob me, and all kinds of other things. But like I said, stories for another time. This motel was on that street that I had mentioned before. Homeless people were everywhere. There was a dude on the far corner of the complex that still had a needle in his arm, passed right out against the building. And I'm a pretty big fan of true crime and horror narration, so I'm on edge. He gets his key. The whole motel is ground level. So to help the guy out, I drive to his door. As I mentioned before, he had a lot of stuff. So I started to help him unload his stuff. While on my second trip getting stuff, I would saw a guy come out of a room just south of my car, then followed by two ladies. They came up to the room I was next to. One of the ladies then pounded on the door, then opened it. That's when I then saw the guy raise a fucking shotgun right out of his long coat and then storm into the room. The two ladies followed him, then slamming the door behind them. Following, I heard a lot of yelling and shouting. I was honestly just waiting for shots to ring out. Out of nowhere, my passenger came up behind me. I can take this man. 
go ahead and take off. Have a Merry Christmas. And he gave me a cash tip. I didn't even notice that he took the boxes out of my hands or slid a $5 bill in my pocket. I was frozen. I knew what may have been going down in that room. I had to leave or at least go to where I could get my gun. I know that the guy and the ladies both saw me and I know that they knew I saw the gun. I just had to get the fuck out of there. You know how it goes. No witnesses. I got in my car and then sped away as quickly as possible. I got a block or so away and then called the cops. I gave them every detail I could. After I got off the phone with the police, I signed out a lift. I hadn't made much money, but I was done. I got a call later that night. The cops investigated. They never found the gunmen or the women. They never answered the door that I saw them come out of. And the occupants of the room they went into said nothing happened and that I was full of shit. Well, I definitely wasn't. I know what I saw. I remember walking out of Walmart with a cart full of gardening supplies a few years back. My mom had sprained her wrist and needed stuff picked up for the start of spring, so it was down to me to go grab some stuff for her. I'm loading the stuff into the trunk of my car when I happen to notice someone walking past me out of the corner of my eye. Kind of took me off by surprise, so I turned around out of instinct and ended up making eye contact with this younger looking guy. He looked like 20 something, workout gear, shaved head, totally normal looking guy who looked like he'd been out for a run or something. I didn't want to seem all confrontational or whatever, so I smiled and said, hey, and just carried on loading all the stuff into my trunk. Next thing I hear is someone saying, was it you? I turn again, and it's the same guy, smiling back at me, having asked me that question. I'm like, was what me? And the guy responds like, you know. I sort of chuckle, thinking it was an honest mistake on the guy's part, thinking I was just someone else or whatever, so I tell him I don't know what he's talking about, then just carry on loading the stuff into my trunk. That's when I hear him walking towards me from his footsteps, so I turn around, hoping things aren't about to get confrontational. But those hopes were totally dashed when I saw the look on his face. He looked livid, and as I'm getting ready for the unfortunate event of having to fight a total stranger for no reason, the guy starts screaming at me. Don't pretend you don't know. You got me transferred. It's because of you I got transferred. He said a bunch of other stuff that might have you censoring this post, so I won't repeat it, but trust me when I say it was language that would have made a stevedore blush. I remember one of the scariest things being how he was still sort of smiling as he started shouting about being transferred. And then as he carried on screaming at me, he went bright red in the face, got this look about him like he was about to murder me, and he actually started spitting as he was screaming due to how out of control he was getting. I'm telling him to calm down that there's been some kind of mistake, and that's all without even asking what he meant by got me transferred. But then every time I try to reason with the guy, he almost takes it like I'm trying to gaslight him or whatever and it just makes him angrier. I don't even know how he managed to conceal it on him, but he pulled out this extendable baton from somewhere and whips it open right in front of me before charging at me. I just reacted, running around my car and screaming for other people in the parking lot to call 911. That was the other scary thing, how most people just stood and watched with their mouths open instead of either calling someone or actually getting involved to help. Then the other really scary thing, the guy screams as he chased me, they went from actual words to just this wild psycho babble, just stuff that barely made sense and only had an actual understandable word every three or four screams. He was completely manic, and it really didn't hit me at the time, but I later found out that he was suffering from a complete mental break. He was way faster than me too, so if it wasn't for me being able to duck and dodge around parked cars, he would have caught up with me in seconds. And then because I didn't have anything to defend myself with, just bags of compost and seeds and whatnot, he might have actually been able to bash my head in and there's not a thing I've been able to do about it too. Eventually, 
some hero of a security guard from a movie theater of all places, he actually ran over and tried tackling the guy chasing me. But this psycho kid swung at him a few times with his baton and then the guy was forced to back off and try to tackle him when he had his back turned, which obviously wasn't easy because the kid was in this, like, super saiyan manic state. Every time he got close, the kid just clocked him, turned, and started swinging. But then, that gave me a window to put some more distance between us. The guy might have actually saved my life in that way. Anyway, the cops showed up after what seemed like way too long, but when they tried tasing the guy... It just had absolutely no effect on him. That was the other thing that scared me. I've actually seen a guy getting tased before, it's a long story, and when the wire things hit him, he just seized up and hit the floor like a statue. But this guy, it just had zero effect on him. Maybe it was a broken taser or whatever, but it was still pretty terrifying to see. The cops wouldn't go into too much detail with me, but... The kid was known to him as suffering from paranoid schizophrenia, and I went from hating the kid to actually feeling really sorry for him incredibly fast. They'd been getting calls about him for the past two days, but he kept on running from the scenes of the calls and getting away before they could actually take him into custody. I don't feel any ill will towards him, and I hope he got the help that he needed, but I'm not kidding when I say he legit could have killed me that day. Easily the scariest thing that's ever happened to me at Walmart. Last January, I was working as an associate at the Walmart over in Lake Charles. I was working second shift, so that's 1pm to 10pm, and it was about 7pm when people started to notice some kind of drama going off in the parking lot. The greeter noticed it first and was actually getting ready to have someone call the cops, but the whole thing seemed to die down and then, from what I heard, things sort of just chilled out. I asked a co-worker if anything juicy had happened and she said no, but that the drama was between two groups of teenage girls and that one of the groups had walked into the store. They weren't being loud or obnoxious or anything, not at first anyway, they were just walking up and down the aisles talking among themselves and one of the girls seemed to be making a video of them just hanging out. I remember hearing one of the girls saying something like, man, I need my taser back. But I just put that down to them talking smack after almost getting into a fight or something. The other thing I know is that loss prevention was watching them after one of them seemed to take something out of the kitchen utensils section, but they were just keeping their distance and observing until they tried to make an exit for the store. This is actually super relevant to what happened later on too, so keep it in mind. Anyways, I went back to what I was doing, then the next thing I know, there's all kinds of screaming coming from near the front section of the store. I walked around to see what was going on, and that's when I see a group of girls in the doorway, shouting at the group that was inside. They were all saying all this stuff like, where are y'all at? Come out. They knew the other group had walked inside the Walmart and were obviously trying to find them. The greeter was trying to get them to calm down or leave, saying they could either stop making a scene or was going to call the cops, but neither group was paying him any mind. Then, one of the girls in the doorway group starts saying something threatening, and the other is all like, I'm about to come out as soon as my sister gets here. But the other girl didn't want to wait for that. She just walks inside the store and marches straight over to this girl with dyed blonde hair. I'm like, ah oh, snap, this is about to go off right here. And honestly, just like that, the two girls start throwing hands at one another in that typical girl fight way, just flailing their hands at one another. Then the girl with blonde hair, she reaches for something in her pants, and although I didn't see it clearly, she swings at the other girl's chest, and it looks a lot like she just punched her. But then as soon as the hit connected, the blonde girl, like, backed up, then ran off while the other girl just sort of staggered back, then looked down at her chest. I didn't see the blood, not right away, I just heard the screams. What I did see was the girl who had been hit stagger a few steps, then just collapse on the floor. Then when her friends dropped down and rolled her over, that's when I saw the blood on the floor. The EMTs were called... The girl was taken away in an ambulance, 
and we were all basically tasked with comforting the girl's friends as they were absolutely all shooken up that they just watched their girl get stabbed. Then, about 9pm, because we had to empty the store out so the cops could do their thing, I was told I could finish early so I could go home and basically and try and get the whole thing out of my head. But then, like a half hour after I walked through the front door of my parents' place, I get an Instagram DM from one of the younger co-workers that I was tight with. They ask something like, You were working second shift tonight, right? And I respond, Yeah, some messed up stuff happened. Then the next thing they send me is this long link that had Facebook in there somewhere. I figured it'd just be a sharing of a news story about the whole stabbing thing, but when I opened up the link, it opens up one of those Facebook Live videos and instantly I knew what I was watching. I knew what I was watching because, one, I recognized one of the girls from the stabbing at work, and two, they're saying things like, that was too much, and if she killed her, she killed her, and then like shrugging it off as if though it was her fault for coming at them and her friend was just defending herself. And then it got way worse. They were literally bragging how they killed someone, and they knew they killed someone too. I mean, I just thought the girl would be taken to the ER or something, but they knew she'd stabbed her in the heart because she aimed to stab her in the heart. We didn't find out until the next day that the girl who got stabbed had died on the way to the hospital. The most effed up thing though, none of those girls looked older than my little sister, who was a high school freshman at the time. Some of them barely looked like they'd gone through puberty yet. I mean, these were literally kids, literally effing children, and they just killed somebody and were proud of it. I think maybe it was just that they were trying to hide how scared they were, or trying to establish the whole self-defense thing before the cops came looking for them. But my god, seeing that kind of savagery coming out of a kid made my heart break for humanity a little. Those girls had ruined their lives with one little fight, and even worse, they'd literally ended another girl's. Taking her away from her family, friends, all she had going for her in life, all because of one stupid fight. I used to work the late shift at a Walmart here in Jacksonville and every night after finishing at like one in the morning, I'd walk to the exact same bus stop to call an Uber. Now, this whole story would never have happened if my dumb self didn't just get picked up from work but I always liked having a smoke as soon as I finished and it wasn't the kind of thing that management would have taken kindly to me smoking right outside of the Walmart. It was the arrested and fired kind of smoke, so I used to walk to the bus stop. Anyway, this one night I'm sitting there, smoking away and the Uber is maybe only three or four minutes away. Seconds later, when I see this dude in the distance walking towards the bus stop, I immediately started getting bad vibes. Getting bad vibes from people when I was smoking up was hardly anything out of the ordinary, but I still figured that I'd keep an eye on him as he walked past, just in case he tried anything funny. He walks past me, but only by a few feet, and then he stops and leans against the bus stand like he's waiting for the bus with me. Now, I know well that there's no bus coming, so why is he just standing like there like he's waiting for one? That's when the bad vibes about the guy seriously intensified because he was definitely acting weird. The only question was if they had any bad intentions for me. I'm getting more and more nervous watching the little blip on my phone screen getting closer and closer and as much as I'm trying not to make eye contact with the guy, I can see him looking over at me every so often, like he's sizing me up or something. I'm feeling pretty thankful by the time my Uber rounds a corner and I start to see its headlights. But as it pulls up, I actually think that maybe my paranoia might be starting to get the better of me, and maybe it's just me being the judgmental one instead of the guy actually posing any kind of threat. Then literally, as I open the door to the Uber, the guy says, You lucky kid. I look back, and he has this grin on his face that literally made my skin crawl. That's when I realize he did actually have something in mind for me. I don't know what it was, whether or not he planned on robbing me or just beating me up or whatever it was. I just know it wasn't good. 
and I thanked Christ that my Uber showed up when it did. This occurred several years ago. I used to shop at Walmarts quite frequently. They really sold everything I needed and were all over the place, so it was always my first door to go to. At one point, I had to go out of town for a work conference. It lasted about a week and was about a 10 hour drive away. After it was over, I was driving back. I was on the way home about halfway and it got pretty late at night. I was prepared to drive through the night, but my car got low on gas, so I stopped at the next exit and filled it up. I was pretty hungry, but noticed that the convenience store of the gas station was closed. This town was really small and didn't seem to have much, but they did have a Walmart that was across the street. This Walmart was one of the strangest ones I had ever seen. It just wasn't the typical kind of Walmart building that they usually are in. The building seemed smaller, and more as if it had taken over a building of a previous store that had been there. The parking lot was quiet, only a couple of cars, so I looked it up on Google Maps, and it said sure enough it was open. This seemed kind of surprising to me because it was around midnight, but I pulled my car into the parking lot and went inside. As I slowly walked in, I didn't really know what I was looking for, but I guess just some type of food. As I walked around inside, I didn't notice anybody else. The inside of the Walmart looked for the most part like a regular Walmart, but at the same time, a lot different. It was much smaller inside and arranged differently than most of the ones I had been in. Still, not a big deal though, and I tried to find something I could snack on. As I walked around, I didn't see anybody else in the store at all. It seemed a little bit odd to not even see a worker, but then again, it was midnight in a small town that I had never been in before. I had made it to the back aisle and was looking around when I heard the noise of someone walking. They entered the aisle from the far side from where I was in, and I noticed it was someone wearing one of those horse face masks that covers a person's whole head. I looked and it startled me at first, but then I chuckled. I guess it was some guy pranking people late at night. He stood there looking at me. Then he walked away. I told him it was very funny. I finally found a couple of things and picked them up, then I headed to the front of the store. As I did, I noticed another person walking by, also wearing a horse mask. I thought maybe it had to be the guy's friend and they were both in on the joke. I once again smiled and kept walking. I used the self-checkout and paid for my things, all while not seeing a single employee. As I was almost done, I saw another two people emerge from behind one of the check lanes. They were both wearing horse masks as well. By that time, I got a rush of fear run through my body. I didn't know what was going on, but it didn't really seem like a joke to me anymore. I looked back and saw the other two people in horse masks staring at me from the back near the aisles. I tried to not let them see the fear that I had. I calmly got my receipt and walked away and out the doors. I walked all the way back to my car hoping that I wouldn't hear the footsteps of anyone leaving behind me, and to my surprise, I didn't. But when I got to my car, I realized there was a new car that was parked next to mine. I tried to ignore it as best as I could, and got to my car, unlocked it, and quickly got inside. As I did, I glanced over to the car parked next to mine. At first, it looked like it was empty, but then I saw a horse mask pop up in the driver's seat. I just about had a heart attack in that moment. I slammed my foot on the gas and left that city back to the freeway and on my way home. I got home the next day and still wonder what was going on there. Last summer, I worked at a Walmart, mostly stocking shelves late at night. It was pretty easy and was really the first real job that I had. One night, I happened to be working at around 11 o'clock p.m. We were still open at that time, but we would rarely get many customers then because we closed at midnight. I was in an aisle where we sold pet supplies at the very back end of the store, just stocking a shelf. I heard somebody walking close by and then saw a man enter the aisle and start to approach me. I really didn't like when customers would ask me questions, but I would always do my best to answer them. He came closer to me, and when he did, I noticed that some of his clothes were ripped, and he seemed a little bit off. 
He said to me that he had a question for me. Then he began to ask something, but never really got to the question. He stopped himself and slowly said to me that he didn't like me. His face changed to an angry look. I had no idea what to do, but I figured this man had to be on some sort of drugs. He slowly walked behind the aisle we were in. I just shook my head and went back to work, but I could tell that the man was just standing there barely around the corner. As I took products out of boxes and placed them on the shelves, I noticed out of the corner of my eye, the man stick his head around the corner for a second and then go back. He still had a very angry look on his face. I did my best to ignore him and figured that he would walk away soon enough. About five minutes passed by, and as far as I knew, he was still there. Then out of nowhere, several items came flying off the shelf near me as if they had been pushed from the other side. Now this annoyed me. I said in a firm voice to the man that he should just get whatever he came here to get and leave. What he said in response was that he was going to get me, and then he called for me to come around the corner to the other side. I ignored it and started to pick up the items that fell. He called out a couple of more times for me to come out, but I just ignored him once again. About a minute later, I heard the sound of more people in the aisle next to mine. It sounded like four or five men were suddenly in the aisle. I decided to walk over and look, and saw several police officers start to take the man away. One of the officers walked over to me, and I asked him what happened. He told me that that man had assaulted somebody in a nearby restaurant a few blocks away, in a seemingly random attack, and then fled. He was found at the Walmart seemed like he was going for me next. I had a job a few years ago that was pretty tough. I worked some insanely long days and got home very late at night sometimes. One night I was working late and I left work so sleepy that I could barely stay awake. I began driving home, and after about 10 minutes, I knew I wouldn't make it all the way back before falling asleep. I pulled into the next exit where there was a 24-hour Walmart that I knew of. It was sometime after 2 in the morning when I got there. My goal was to just walk around a little bit to wake up, and maybe buy an energy drink or something with caffeine in it. I got inside the store and began to walk around. I only saw a few customers at the front end of the store with some employees, but other than that it seemed almost completely empty. I was walking around the back end of the store for a little bit, slowly starting to feel more awake, when I noticed someone walking behind me. They were walking behind me at an extremely close distance that was very uncomfortable. I stopped and looked behind me. There was a man that was no more than five feet away. He stopped as well and stared at me with a blank look on his face for a second. He was about six feet tall wearing a brown suit jacket with a brown turtleneck. He then turned and walked away into a nearby aisle. I continued to walk around the store, but it wasn't long until the man was back again. This time, as soon as he got close, I turned to him and said, Can I help you? He once again just changed directions and walked away. I decided it would be best for me to just leave at that point. I went and got an energy drink and checked out. I was feeling more awake now though, and also a little bit creeped out by the man. I left the store and walked back to my car. Something about the way the man was staring at me just kind of gave me the creeps. Luckily for me, I was way more awake now, and I was able to drive home without any problems. If that were the full story, it would be bad enough, but sadly it's not. I drove home, and of course when I got there, I fell asleep immediately. But I woke up about an hour or two later to the sound of a truck engine running very loudly. I looked out of my bedroom window to the street. I saw a truck sitting on the street in front of my window. In the front seat was the same man staring at me. He still had that blank look on his face. Almost right away after I looked at him, he screeched his tires and sped away. I've never been able to figure out who this man was or what he wanted from me, but I never did see him again. Anyone who's ever worked a night shift job will tell you that it eventually gets old. I remember being really excited about starting my first night shift job. I thought it would be so cool, like that episode of Spongebob with the hash slinging slasher or something. It was nothing like that at all. 
In fact, it got plain old repetitive after a while. I'm a male nurse and I had been working in a hospital nearby. It was a long commute and extremely unbearable. Once I finished my contract with the hospital, which was about a year, I decided to apply for another job, one that was a little less stressful and disorganized than the hospital. I got a job at a child psychiatric unit. Working with children with mental illnesses seemed like a cool job. Maybe cool isn't the right word, but meaningful. The hospital left me with this feeling of trying to save people who were going to die anyway. But with these kids, I could make a real difference that might turn their life around or find a way to let them cope with whatever is wrong with them. I was all around excited about it. The pay was even higher, which had me really excited too. The only problem was that the only shift available was the night shift. The hiring manager told me that there might be a day shift position available within a couple of months and I would be the first one to get consideration if it opened, but that was about it. So there I was helping kids, at night. The only issue with that is, is that they were all asleep for the most part. The only time I got to do anything was when one of them woke up or started misbehaving. This very quickly became the most boring job I had ever worked in my life. About a month went by, and something moderately frightening finally happened. It was a night like any other. I was sitting at my desk charting some stuff I had done with other kids earlier that night. I had heard a noise that I did not quite recognize at first. It sounded like some of the kids were wrestling or something, but on the bed. I got anxious. As I did not want to go in there and see mentally handicapped kids doing, um, you know... Call me cynical, but that's where my mind went immediately. But when I got in there, I saw something that I don't think I can ever unsee. I turned the light on to see one of the older kids who was trying to smother another one. The kid who was doing the smothering had no previous incidents of violent behavior. I didn't personally know these kids well enough because I didn't work during the day, but I knew their cases well enough that the kid doing the smothering had bipolar disorder. It was severe, but he had never had a violent outburst like this. It was just so unusual, but I immediately pulled him off the other kid, and then he started fighting me. He reached around his own head and punched me in the nose at a weird angle. This kid had to have been 11 or 12 years old, and I honestly was surprised at how much force he had behind his punch. He didn't break my nose or anything, but he bloodied it up. My adrenaline kicked in after that, and I was able to restrain him without a problem. I called for a nurse from another unit in the building to come over and help me. I felt like this took forever, but was probably only just a few minutes. The entire time I was waiting though, I couldn't help but look at this little kid who had nearly murdered another kid. When the nurse got over, we gave him some medication that would knock him out and sedate him and put him to sleep. I asked the other nurse, Carla, what I was supposed to do. She was there for a few years before me, and I assumed she would have a good answer. We just did everything you can do, kid. Violent outbursts don't get kids thrown out of here very often. I was a little shocked. I argued with her a little, but that was that. I tried talking to the kid that was being smothered, but he didn't really have a whole lot to say about it. He said that he didn't really know the other kid that well, but they never had any negative incidents up until this night. This was a few years back, and I will never forget how I almost watched that kid die. If I had just been there a few minutes later, he could have been dead right now. It wasn't long after that experience that I started looking for another job. I got one a few weeks later and I did my best to explain the situation to my case manager. She didn't seem to understand or care, and that's not my problem anymore. One day like any other, I was sitting in my room doing whatever when I got a notification from Instagram that I got a new follower. It seemed to be one of those random spam-like accounts. The username was Ty13053 and there were five pictures on the profile, all of different typical suburban houses. The profile had two followers, was following three people including me, and none of the pictures had any likes. Comments seemed to be disabled on all of the pictures. I didn't bother blocking or removing the account from my followers, as I had my profile set to public anyway at the time. A couple nights later, I got a notification that the random Ty13053 account liked my most recent picture. Just being curious, I click on the notification and then pull up the profile again. This time there was a new picture on the profile, 
and I instantly recognized it as a picture of my house. I DM'd the profile asking who it was, saying it was very funny. Of course, it had to be one of my friends messing with me. When the person running the account left my DMs on scene and didn't reply, I followed up with, this is harassment and a threat, and that I would have the police follow up on this. I ran to my parents' room to wake them up, as it was past 12 at that point. I showed them the picture of our house, and said someone was messing with me who knew where we lived. They tried to rationalize, and said the same thing I thought, that it was someone from my school messing with me. My dad and I both went outside regardless to have a look around the property and on the street. It was a ghost town out there though, as it should be past 12 o'clock. We went back inside into our respective bedrooms. I wasn't actually going to pursue it with the police at that exact moment. It was obvious to me, at least in the moment, that someone who knew me was pranking me. I stayed up for a few more hours, and around the time I was about to go to bed, I got a DM from the account. It was an image, another image of my house. It was on the side this time. As I had the chat opened, he sent another, this time a picture of my window, with the glare from the TV in my room visible in the picture. I didn't dare get up and look out the window. Wouldn't you guess it, the next DM for the account was, look out your window. I turned off the TV to allow total darkness in the room. I didn't want to be seen by whoever was at my window. I quietly crawled off my bed onto the floor in the dark. As I was crawling on the carpet towards the door, a pounding on the window started. I don't want to say knocking, because these bangs on the glass sounded loud enough to shatter it. Inevitably, I turned, and of course, saw a person at the window. Facial features though, impossible to make out. I got up and ran out of my room and to my parents' room once again. I pulled my dad out of the bed and led him to my room. He heard the end of the bangs on my window, but by the time we got to my room, the guy at the window was gone. The banging was all my dad needed to believe me and take this seriously though. We called the cops that second and talked to the officers who came. They said the good news was since the person was contacting me through Instagram, they could track the person after putting a legal request into Instagram. So that same night, we followed the cop car to the nearest precinct, where we went through this long process. They took the account name and my details of the story, and literally the next day, we found out who it was. It was this kid named Luke who went to my high school. As much as I want to give the last name, that could lead to issues. Luke was a very, very weird kid that didn't talk to many people. He was just a very mean, unpleasant, and scary dude. Not scary like tough. Scary like some would even fear he'd do something crazy that would harm students or staff. I don't know why he targeted me. I never even spoke to the kid. But this really proved how dangerous he was. He hid my window so hard we found small cracks on it in the daylight. He was arrested and we got him for a harassment charge, an attempted breaking and entering charge, and I think a couple others. This happened back in the summer of 2018. At that time, I used to work out with my two friends, Jared and Spencer. We had just graduated high school and would go to the gym every morning together and work out. Sometimes we would hang out afterwards or get food. I remember that Jared kept saying he really liked Costco's pizza and he wanted us to try it. Personally, I didn't think it would be all that great and I didn't even have a Costco membership, but I was willing to try it. One day after the gym, Jared convinced us to go. Spencer and I were both hesitant, but we figured why not go with. As it turns out, when we got there, Jared didn't have a Costco membership either. He told us that all the times he had gone before, he had been able to sneak in without anybody stopping him and asking him for a membership card. The store looked pretty busy, so we all decided to try to walk in behind somebody else and hope that nobody would notice or care. We went inside behind several people and were able to make it in okay. We walked over towards the food area where they sold the pizza and other food like ice cream and hot dogs. But before we could get in line to order, a man approached us. He was a younger looking man who worked at Costco and asked to see our membership cards. At that point, we all came clean and told the man that none of us had memberships, but were just hoping to get a pizza. The man told us that we couldn't do that without a membership, but said he could offer us a daily pass to each of us that we could use. I wanted to just leave, 
but we all decided to follow the man to get our passes. He led us towards the side of the store and through a doorway leading to the back room. There was a hallway that we walked down from there, and then he led us into this weird type of back room. The lights were off inside the room, but the man told us to go inside. As we did, the man turned the lights on, and when the lights came on, it revealed about five large, scary-looking men inside the room, all staring at us with ski masks covering their heads. They were not wearing Costco clothes or even any type of work clothes. We all turned to the door, but the original man stood there with his arms out as if he was going to block us. One of the men told us to do as they say. Jared turned and ran at the man blocking the doorway immediately and actually knocked him down. I followed, and then Spencer ran behind me. We all ran past the man and back out the hallway. Finally, we made it inside Costco again, where there were other shoppers and we felt more safe. We then looked back but didn't see any of the men, so we decided to just leave without getting a Costco pizza or anything. It was just so weird what had happened, and I have no idea what those men wanted from us. We never reported it or anything like that either. I used to shop at Costco all the time. As a mother of three children, all under 10 years old, we go through a lot of food in our household. One night, I was shopping for some groceries like I often would. It was a quiet night at Costco, and not very many other people were there at all. As I was passing through one of the aisles, I came across some crates. I noticed that behind some of the crates, I could just barely see a man hiding behind them. I thought it was a funny joke because I had seen some videos where people would hide in stores like Walmart between the aisles, so I ignored the man and kept going. I was in the store for quite a while longer, and as I was on the opposite end of the store, I just barely noticed the man again. He was once again hiding behind some crates, and this time, I caught him staring right at me. I ignored it again and kept on going, but I suddenly felt a little bit creeped out. I didn't really get a look at the man at all because he was hunched over and hiding behind crates, but he seemed pretty average. As I finished up getting things, I couldn't help but start looking over my shoulder a little bit. It was just really strange to see a man hiding and looking at me two different times. I got the last of my several items on my list and then started towards the front of the store to check out. As I did, I glanced behind me noticed the man was there once again. He and I were the only people in the aisle, and the man appeared to be walking right behind me about 10 feet back. He was also just staring right at me, and when I looked at him, he didn't even pretend to be looking at something else. He just remained staring at me. I was about to ask the man why he had been following me, when he suddenly turned and ran in the opposite direction, and out of the aisle that we were in. At that point, I was just so happy that he left me alone, that I began to walk quickly to the checkout to leave Costco took me maybe 30 seconds to get to the check lanes, but as soon as I got there, I heard a commotion and some noise coming from about 30 feet away near one of the aisles. I saw the man who had been following me literally fighting with another man and throwing him to the ground. I watched as the man then got up after wrestling with the other man and ran away once again. He got out of sight, and there wasn't many people in the store at all, but I heard somebody in the distance yell to call the police. I got out my phone and then ran outside leaving my cart full of groceries. It didn't take long at all for the police to arrive, and I waited outside as they got the man out of the store. The man was basically crazy, and tried to attack two people before attempting to run away. If I hadn't turned around and caught the man following me, who knows if he would have attacked me as well. This story happened a few years ago. I was on my way home when my friend John called me and asked if I could pick him up some food from Chipotle. John lived in my same apartment building, so we would occasionally get food for each other and stuff. We also happened to be pretty good friends. I said sure because it was on my way home, but when I got to Chipotle, I realized that it was closed. The Chipotle was very close to a Costco and was sort of in the same parking lot. I drove into the Costco parking lot, which was also empty, and checked on my phone. Both places were closed, so I texted John to tell him that they were closed and asked him if he wanted me to pick him up something else. As I sat in the empty Costco parking lot waiting for a response, I noticed another car driving into the parking lot and pulling up next to me. I looked over, wondering why in the whole entire empty parking lot someone would park right next to me. 
I didn't recognize the car, and it didn't look like a police car or anything like that. When I looked over, the windows were tinted so I couldn't see inside. Then another car pulled in shortly after, followed by several more. The cars all parked next to me or very close to me, and in total there had to be close to ten of them. At this point, I was feeling really confused and even slightly concerned. All the cars remained running, and finally, I saw a door open up. I noticed a man get out. He had on a cap and sunglasses. He walked right up to the passenger side of my car, and then I noticed another man get out of his car and aggressively walk towards my driver's side. The man at the passenger's window knocked on my door, and I slightly rolled down the window just a crack. As soon as it was open, the man reached his hand in as far as he could and then tried to push the window down the rest of the way. I knew at this point that I was in trouble and clicked to roll it back up. That's when the man quickly reached his hand out of the window and banged it on it really hard. I had enough at this point and put my car into reverse and started to back away. When this happened, the men raced back to their cars. But at the same time, I noticed another car start to drive towards the parking lot. All within about 10 seconds, all the men had returned to their cars and all of the cars drove off out of the parking lot in all different directions, leaving me alone. Just like that, they were all gone and I was just sitting there in the middle of the Costco parking lot all by myself. I was pretty freaked out and decided just to drive home. Luckily, I wasn't followed or anything like that, but I don't understand who those people were or what they wanted from me. After work, I like to go with co-workers to Waffle House sometimes. It's fun, relaxing, and relatively cheap. However, tonight I decided to go out with a couple of girls I work with. I don't have a vagina myself, but since we all closed up together, we thought we would go grab something to eat. So while we're eating, I'm facing the door, and in walk these two drugged out looking people, which isn't uncommon for Waffle House. But something about these two people in hoodies in the middle of summer in Texas really put me on edge. The two girls I was with were both pretty attractive, and the two guys also took note as they walked past. I've been in a couple of sticky situations and can always tell when shit is about to go down, and these guys gave off that vibe like no other. They sat behind me where I couldn't see them in any reflection. It was nerve-wracking. A few minutes went by before I realized that it was just our two groups in the restaurant. I glanced over my shoulder and saw they weren't eating anything, just drinking and staring at us. Fuck. I told the two girls I was with that we should try to hurry up and go because I was tired, trying not to freak them out, because assholes like those guys feed on fear. We got up, and I look over at them. They were still watching us with empty drinks now. At this point, I should say two things. I have an injured knee right now from practice that causes me to limp a little, and I train in Muay Thai boxing and compete internationally in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I am not one to be fucked with, but the limp definitely gives off the impression that I would be easy to overpower. So as we were paying, I noticed one of the guys point at me and make a stabbing motion, and the other guy smiled, and they both stood up, and walked towards us. One of the girls I was with was making sexual passes at me, which were very visual. I told her to stop as these guys got closer, and I saw one lick his lips as the other held one hand in his pocket. I told the hostess to keep the change and hurried the girls outside while trying to hide my limp as best I could. We got to the parking lot, and I told one girl to go to her car and gave the other the keys to my car and told them to hurry up and get in, since I couldn't run with my limp, and that I would explain later. The guys came out as I was getting in my car, and I saw one of them pulling something out of his pocket, and heard him yell something I couldn't make out over the sound of us noping the fuck out of there. I texted the girl who I wasn't taking home, and explained the situation, and why I was acting weird. I hate to think about what could have happened if I had not been paying attention to my surroundings. Bad shit almost went down because of, I'm assuming, crackheads at Waffle House. This story is from a female's perspective. To preface, I was about 25 years old when this happened. My boyfriend and I had been out visiting with friends, and we left their house late around 2am. 
Now, I've never been much of a drinker. I was addicted to opiates at the time, but that's neither here nor there. So I did the driving. On our way back, we decided to call in some omelets from the Waffle House, which is the only place where we can get takeout in the super early morning. We arrived at the Waffle House and I went inside to pick up our orders. As I was paying for the order, a young man to my left began pacing and mumbling angrily, muttering something I couldn't understand. I didn't really think much of it, since most diner patrons are either drunk or truck drivers at that time of day. When I collected the food and turned to leave, I noticed a young woman outside of the diner. She too was angrily pacing back and forth, grimacing and cursing. The young man followed me out into the parking lot. I sidestepped the woman to get to my car. The young man had gotten into another car, and the young woman sat in the passenger seat. Whatever, I thought. Tweakers. The car with the two tweakers screeched to a halt behind my car, pinning us to the parking spot. Within seconds, the man was knocking ferociously on my driver's side window and yelling at me. I rolled up the window and backed my car up a few inches. He continued to scream at me through the window, then leapt back into his car with his girlfriend. They peeled backwards and exited the parking lot. At that point, my boyfriend and I were amused more than anything else, and we re-entered the highway. Just then, we heard the same car roar up behind us. The man was driving like an absolute maniac to dodge other cars, traffic lights, and stop signs, until he got so close to us that their car nearly rammed into our back bumper. I weaved in and out of the sparse traffic as safely as I could in an attempt to throw them off our route. Each time, he managed to pull up behind us again. He clicked his brights on and off and leaned on his horn. Inside our car, it was blinding and deafening. I sure as hell wasn't going home so that these tweaked, unhinged people would know where I lived. I swear it was almost like I could still hear him screaming even over the blaring car horn. My boyfriend and I didn't do much talking, as I suppose we were both shocked and trying to figure out what to do. Fuck this, I told him. We're going to the police station. I doubled back, the car still bearing down on us. When I pulled into the police station, they followed. I locked my car doors. I picked up my cell phone and began to ring the station, because I sure as shit wasn't going to get out of my car. The man practically ran out of his car up to my window, again, banging and yelling. At this point, I had gone way beyond concerned and scared to absolutely pissed. We want our goddamn money. You leave me the fuck alone. I'll let the fucking cops search me for your girlfriend's fucking wallet. The man then went silent. I'm on the phone with the cops right now. Uh, if you don't have it, I guess you don't have it. He then sprinted back to his car with his sour-faced girlfriend and burnt rubber out of there. I stayed in the police station parking lot for a while, talking to the cops on duty. When we finally left at about 3.30 a.m., I still made several loops through our town before eventually heading home, arriving after 4 a.m. Legally, nothing came of the incident. I had no idea what the couple's names were, nor did I get a license plate number. We gave the cops descriptions of their physical appearances and vehicle, but they seemed far more interested in making sure I wasn't drunk. <laughs> Thanks, fellas. I'm fairly certain that the maniac couple was pulling a strong-armed con job, or they were actually convinced that I'd mysteriously and magically stolen the girl's wallet, even though they were pacing and muttering as soon as I'd entered the diner, and even before I paid for the takeout and that methamphetamine psychosis was responsible for the bizarre severity of their behavior. Anyway, fuck those assholes. My omelets were cold and rubbery by the time I got home. So a few years ago, I used to work at the Waffle House in a college town, so weird people aren't really that unusual. To start off, there are only two 24-hour restaurants there, and I used to work third shift at the Waffle House. Sometimes, when a person's car would break down, the police would drop them off at one of these two places. They weren't supposed to, so they would drop them off within walking distance, but not actually outside, like some shitty loophole. So one night I was working with a cook and another waitress. We'll call them Mark and Cassie. 
Around 11 p.m., this old guy wanders into the lobby with a little bag. First off, we usually don't get older people after around 8 or so at the latest. Second off, this dude is creepy as fuck. He starts off with telling us about how his car broke down on the highway and the police dropped him off in the parking lot next door. I felt bad for him because it's the middle of the night and he's not from around here and he has no money. So I pour him some coffee free of charge. My coworkers are usually on drugs, so I assume free coffee isn't going to get me fired. This is when the guy just starts talking my ear off. I can barely get in a word edgewise, which is difficult since I'm usually the talker. He talks about what happened to him, and then starts trying to sell the tools he has with him in his bag. Of course we say no, but he just keeps asking about it. He also starts wandering in and out of the store. The first time he does, Mark, whose ex-military, searches his bag to make sure he doesn't have any weapons because he's starting to raise some eyebrows. There was nothing but tools, so we start to feel a bit safer. When he comes back in, I keep talking to him. Mark and Cassie note the fuck away to the other side of the store and watch. Keep in mind, this guy is literally the only person here. We don't start getting people until 1.30 when everyone leaves the bars. Now he's starting to talk about a lot of weird things. I tell him I'm interested in studying prisons, and he tells me the best way to do so is to get arrested. He then starts talking about how he used to be in prison, but he never says why. He starts to make us really nervous, so I start to draw him in case the dude decides to murder us. We'll have something because I'm good at drawing things I can see. There's a low little wall where we usually write out customer receipts, so I can draw him without him noticing. Not that that matters since he's looking straight ahead while he talks to me. We start getting customers because it's about 1am. The bars are let out at 1, so anyone who drives gets there shortly after, while those who walk get there about 30 minutes later. And this guy keeps talking no matter where I am. He doesn't raise his voice or anything. He just keeps talking at the same level, even when I walk away to take care of other customers. At this point, I'm starting to think this guy is schizophrenic. I'm a psych major, so I mean actual schizophrenia, and not just crazy. And at this point, wanting to get away, but I really can't because I'm afraid he might do something. He does, but not what I was afraid of. He starts just insulting customers. He tells one kid that he's fat, and starts asking him why he's so fat, and tells him he needs to lose weight. He then talks to a family of travelers and says, Your wife and kids are fine, but why are you so ugly? We decide he has to go. Mark tells him he has to leave, as we've warned him several times to leave the other customers alone. So Mark tells him to leave, or we're going to call the cops. The guy starts yelling at us, and glares at me, and asks why he should leave. But he finally just does after a while. But he comes back at half an hour later, and we have to kick him out again for harassing customers. He doesn't come back that night, so we decide he must have found a way home or contacted someone. So I finish around 7am and walk home. I live above the bars downtown, so it's a 30 minute walk, but along the way, I see the old guy. I dart behind a building and take the long way home. I don't think much of it because it's a small town and there's not a lot of places to go. I have to work again the next day, so I go home, sleep, get all my chores done, being an adult as usual. So about an hour before work, Waffle House calls me, and my coworker Kevin tells me the same old guy has been coming around several times during the day, every couple of hours looking for me. I'm a 23-year-old female, so they're worried about what he wants. I call my friend Jason and tell him why I need a ride, and he brings me in. I ask what's been going on, and apparently this guy has been in at least 10 times asking to talk to me. He never says why, so I'm on edge, waiting because I have no idea what this guy wants. Is this a 60 year old guy pissed off because I didn't defend him when he was kicked out? Is he asking because I told him my name? Or is it something else? Surprisingly, for the first few hours of my shift, we didn't see him, but he eventually comes in and ignores me. I'm super confused, but I keep an eye on him again. I've also brought pepper spray. 
Before long though, we kick him out again for harassing customers. This is all very confusing for me. He's been asking for me all day and then ignores me when he comes in. But after we kick him out, he does not come back. When my shift ends, my friend asked me if I need a ride home. I tell him no. This guy has left and hasn't come back, so I'm good. Well, that's what I thought until I saw him walking towards me after work. He yells out for me and starts coming at me. But I run inside a building that I know has another exit. I sneak out the other way before this guy can find me and thanking every god I can think of that I know the small town better than him. I still have no idea what he wants, but I'm not taking any chances. I sneak home through some back ways. I call work and let them know what happened and asked for the next few days off. They agree and later tell me the old guy kept coming in for the next few days and they finally called the police and they took him away. We've lived in our neighborhood for nearly four years. A few houses down and across the street is a Filipino family. They're pretty nice and whenever we see each other we always have small talk and we know each other by name. We moved in right before I gave birth to my oldest, so they always ask for the baby and they love seeing them. We have even had meals at each other's homes before. This summer, they had an older family member, maybe 55 to 60 years old, come to visit. We noticed him right away because he would always go for long walks and lingered a lot. One evening, the mother of the family introduced him as her father. He had recently moved and would be staying with them for a while before heading north to her sister's house. He was pretty new to the US and spoke a little English. Just enough to get by. He seemed nice enough, but as soon as we walked inside, I told my husband that he gave me a really weird vibe. I had never felt that way of any of the seven other family members from the home. I've been in their home and shared meals with them. They're very sweet and welcoming. My husband also told me that he did seem a little off, but we just chalked it up to cultural differences. Fast forward about a month. My mother-in-law and my mother came to visit at the very same time. They're in the driveway with our son. I run inside because I'm pregnant and I suffer from severe morning sickness. I come back out 15 minutes later and they're having a frustrating conversation with this man. He was trying to get one of them to drive him to the store and he would use a food stamp slash EBD card to buy their groceries and wanted them to give him cash. They both told him that they weren't interested but he just kept asking and lingering. When I went outside I called out to my husband to come out and when he saw us he walked away very quickly. Both of our mothers told us what had happened and how forceful that he was being with them. The next few days that I see him walking, we always wave and say simple pleasantries, but every time I would wave, he would take it as a sign to come over and try to have a conversation. I began to let him know that what he did with our mothers is very illegal and to be so forceful was really unnecessary. He said that he understood, but he would linger. It would always be at a moment where I was trying to strap my toddler to his car seat and I was rushing to get him to school. It would always take me about 10 minutes to get him to get the hint that I couldn't talk and he would slowly walk away and just linger in our driveway. It eventually got to the point where I would watch to see if he had walked past our house on his morning walk before venturing outside. I really just hated the awkward conversation. He would always seem to round the corner just as I finished strapping my son in the car and I was getting in. I would wave and then jump in quickly and drive off. It just felt really off, like he was waiting for me. One of our neighbors across the street one night told me that she got a weird vibe from him as well. And again, he always lingered. She told me that he did similar things with her when they were outside as well. They were opting to hang in the backyard with the kids just to avoid it altogether. Now, I usually work from home, but one day I went into the office and I was then alerted by the ring camera. This man was standing and looking in through our kitchen window, just peering, and I could hear our pit bull barking at him. When he saw our dog, he jumped back and I used the microphone to say, 
Can I help you? What do you want? He looked absolutely shocked and then scurried away. I called my husband and I told him to play the video. We both thought it was really creepy. Whenever we saw the family walking that evening, we decided to bring it up to his daughter. She spoke to her father and he claimed that it never happened. We then showed her the video on her phone and he said that he must have gotten lost. The daughter seemed pretty annoyed by him and the entire situation. So him being weird kind of calmed down a bit after that I could see that his daughter was really annoyed by his behavior. And as they were walking, there was a really heated conversation. She later told me that he tends to be overly friendly and he really means no harm, but she talked to him and he would leave us alone. I asked if he had some kind of mental issue or maybe Alzheimer's since he was always getting lost. She told me no and that he had always acted like that and that she couldn't wait until her sister was ready for him to be sent up north to her. There were a few other neighbors that had also complained to her and the homeowners association as well. Well, about two months later, I dropped my son off to preschool. I get home and I have to rush in because I feel really sick. Usually I leave my car door open, but something told me to lock it as soon as I got out. I did so as I was rushing inside. I would also normally leave the door unlocked if I was just going for a quick throw up session, but again, my instincts told me to lock the bottom and top lock. When I was in the bathroom, right by the front door throwing up my life, I then hear a rattling at the front door. Someone is turning the lock back and forth. Of course, my ring chimes and I then look at it in between heaves. What do you know? It's the old man and he's trying to get into our home. I go over to the microphone and then say, You're at the wrong house. To which he responds with, Let me in, now. I want to tell you something. Now, I kid you not, it was the best English sentence I had ever heard from someone who wasn't that good with English. I started to feel better pretty quickly and I was now on high alert. I responded with, what do you want to tell me? He looked right at the camera. Let me in your house, now! This is where I started to panic. He knew he was at the wrong house, but still he was continuing to try and break in. I respond, Please get off my property. I don't feel comfortable with you here, and I'm not letting you in my house. He then starts rattling at the door again really hard and tries to pull it open, and then starts knocking on the bathroom window. This is where I get pissed. Get the hell off my damn property right now. I'm not going to let you in. If you don't get the hell out of here right now, I'm calling the cops. He then steps back, gives the camera the middle finger, and scurries off. He disappears and I run upstairs and see that he's simply walking back to his house. I let our pit bull out of our bedroom as he had been going crazy during this whole ordeal. I call my husband and he tells me to call the daughter and tell her what happened. I call her and I tell her what happened and she told me not to let him in, ever. She began to warn me that he's been very inappropriate and forceful with all of the women in her family and she didn't want me to get hurt, especially being pregnant. She eventually comes over about an hour later and I show her the video. She's absolutely fuming over this and very apologetic and she begs me not to call the cops. She promises me he'll be gone within the next day. The next day, he eventually flies out and his daughter told him that he's no longer welcome in her home. He now lives up north somewhere in Maryland with his other daughter and probably harassing other people as well. I honestly really don't know what would have happened if I didn't follow my instincts that day. I'm just really glad I'm okay. This story happened to me when I was in third grade. I was about eight years old at the time. My regular babysitter was ill, so my mom asked one of our neighbors who had kids and babysit a lot of the neighborhood kids if she would watch my brother and I for a few hours. We were having so much fun at Brandy's house when my mom came to pick us up. I asked if I could stay a little bit longer and finish Madagascar, as we had just started watching it. She said that it was fine, but I was to walk straight home right after. It was like maybe half a block, so not that far at all. 
So as the movie finishes, Brandy said that I needed to get home really fast because it was dark out. As I'm walking home, this other neighbor, Dennis, is just standing outside in his front yard. Now, I had seen Dennis around the neighborhood because his wife was very unforgettable looking. They have a daughter that was like maybe four-ish at the time, so I didn't ever play with her or know her family outside of seeing them around the neighborhood. Dennis starts calling out to me, saying, Hey, what are you doing? I'm just going to my parents. Do you want to come inside for a little bit? No, that's okay. My mom told me to come straight home. Aw, oh, come on. I'm sure she wouldn't mind. Uh, no thanks. Come on. I have a daughter who would absolutely love to play with you. We can even make snacks. At this point, I was just like, Red flag, abort mission, and I started booking it home really fast. Then he starts following me. Not quickly, just kind of walking like Michael Myers. It was creepy. Luckily, I eventually made it home, and once he saw that I was approaching my house with my porch light on, he completely backed off. I'd like to mention that behind our houses was a giant wooded area with paths that led to a nearby lake. So, I mean, this dude could have caught me and dragged me into the woods or something. I try not to think like that, but like, what other motives could he have had, you know? Fast forward until I'm in high school and working at a restaurant in town. I see creepy Dennis and his wife all the time. As it turns out, they were secret shoppers at our restaurant. I don't think he really recognized me working there, though. Anyways... I know this isn't your typical horror story of someone getting dragged into the woods, but still, as a child, this was a very creepy experience to go through. If you're a young child walking home alone, always watch your surroundings. You just never know. So, about a year ago, my apartment complex decided that they wanted to renovate my unit, so I had to move out at the end of my lease. I live in Denver and my rent is pretty ridiculous here, so I started worrying about finding something affordable in my neighborhood, which I really love. I posted on the Nextdoor app to see if anyone in my neighborhood knew of any affordable rentals in the area. I immediately got a message from someone named Joe who said that one of the condos in his complex was going to be up for rent pretty soon and he knew the owner. He offered to get me in touch with the owner. I asked if he could send me pictures of the unit, and he asked if he could text me some pictures that his neighbor took because the chat function on the app is really slow. I now feel really stupid for doing this, but eventually gave him my phone number. I kid you not, I received a phone call from an unknown number within seconds. Now, I normally don't answer calls from unknown numbers, but I was expecting a call from a number that wasn't saved in my phone, so I answered it. I was completely bewildered when the person then said, Hi, it's Joe. How's your day going? Huh? It really took me by surprise and I didn't really know what to say. He started to just shoot the crap on the phone, talking about how he works nights and how tired he is and how he takes care of his daughter while his girlfriend works during the day. I finally interrupted and then said, So, about the condo? He pretty much completely disregarded that and then said, I really don't think that my girlfriend would appreciate me talking to you, but I don't have to tell her, right? I said that I have to go and then immediately hung up the phone. And as soon as I did, he then started texting me. It was really bizarre and quite alarming to me. I blocked his number and then moments later, he found me on Facebook and sent me a friend request. Now, I'm 32 years old, but it was really creepy to me, and I even called my parents to tell them about it, and just how unnerved that it made me. And the worst part about it is that on next door, even if your exact address isn't listed, your complex is. So, I was pretty certain that I didn't have my address visible in my profile, but I checked, and sure enough, my address and unit number were totally public. Unable to really contact me in any other way, he started messaging me again on Nextdoor, asking me if I wanted to go on a walk with him. You can't really block or report people on the app, so I just decided to delete it. So one night about a month or so later, 
I had a knock on my door at around 10 p.m. on a week night. I looked out my peephole but couldn't really get a good look. I saw that it was a man who slightly had his head down. Either way, I don't answer the door for anyone that I'm not expecting, especially not a random guy at 10 o'clock at night. Feeling panicked, I decided to call my neighbor across the hall. She's an older woman and we always look out for each other since we both live alone. I asked her if it looked like he was some kind of delivery guy at the wrong door. She opened her door to try and get a good look at the guy and that spooked him because he literally ran away. I honestly have no idea if this was the next door guy or not, but my gut tells me that it was. This was a big wake up call. I always felt that I practiced good online safety, but I didn't even know that my address was visible on next door. I'll never be that casual or lazy about privacy settings like that ever again. I'm 28 years old, but when I was about 5 years old, my mom and I lived in this duplex that was off a main road and kind of in a wooded area. We lived on one side and the other was a woman and her son. He was studying to be a teacher. My mother had me pretty young so she was about 25 years old and the guy was in his early 20s. He would often come and talk to my mom. My mother said that he would ask a lot of questions about me and ask my mother if it would be alright for him to take me for walks in the woods. Of course, my mother always declined. My mother worked in the operating room at the local hospital and was on call a lot so most of the weekends I stayed at my grandma's house. One night while I was at my grandma's house, my mom was home alone, sleeping. She woke in the middle of the night and said she doesn't remember if she heard something or felt someone in the room, but she woke up. She could see feet wearing socks that were sticking out from the end of her bed. She grabbed her bedside lamp and was about to hit the intruder when our neighbor then yelled her name and then said his name. He couldn't really explain why he was naked and only wearing socks, but he begged my mother not to tell his mother about it. My mother, of course, called the cops. She ended up going to court and making a victim impact statement against this guy because she was absolutely terrified that he'd become a teacher and be around children. She says that she's pretty sure that he was there for me that night and was so happy that I wasn't there. We ended up moving pretty much immediately after that happened. She just couldn't stay another night in that house. I'm just really glad that nothing happened to me or my mother. Who really knows what would have happened if he would have succeeded in whatever he was trying to do that night. This happened to me back when I was around 12 years old. I was going through some of my old cringy notebooks and journals with my girlfriend and I found my old journal entry where I wrote about this day and all the memories came flooding back to me. I used to live in what I thought was a really safe and secure private community. I wasn't allowed to just wander around too far from home without supervision but because our neighborhood was a gated community, my parents would let me walk around within the gates anytime that I wanted, even if they weren't home. One day I was riding around the neighborhood after school when I saw a middle-aged woman crying on the floor of her porch with the front door wide open. I was pretty concerned and got off my bike to see what was wrong. She said that she was having problems with her husband and immediately asked me to come in so I could keep her company while she calmed down. My stranger danger sirens were completely going off, so I declined. She kept pushing me. Please, please, just for a moment. I just need someone to talk to. Now, I was raised to always respect elders and to be a good person, but I was also raised to know about stranger danger. So being a young naive kid, I actually felt pretty conflicted about whether I should go in or not. Ultimately, I declined repeatedly enough that she instead asked me to wait outside with her and then sit with her until she felt better. I agreed to this since I felt very safe in my own neighborhood. She asked me to wait on the porch for her while she walked into the house and visibly grabbed a couple of framed pictures from off the wall. She then sat down next to me inside the house while I was sitting on the porch just outside of her door. She then started showing me the pictures. One was of a kid older than me in the local high school football uniform and the other of a man and the same kid. 
She went on to tell me these stories about how she met him and how they spent their honeymoon in Hawaii and how her kid was so good at football, one of the best on his team. She was very worried that if her and her husband got a divorce, she wouldn't be able to see her kid anymore. And then she started bawling again, this time onto my shoulder. This actually caused me to let my guard down quite a bit. For some reason, once I knew she had a kid, I felt a bit more comfortable around her. She was talking for a while though, and I was beginning to start to feel a little awkward as she was on and off crying on my shoulder, and I didn't know how to react in the situation. What the heck did I get myself into? I kept thinking to myself as I nodded my head pretending to listen. I was more concerned about finding a good excuse to tell her I had to go home. She kept calling me such a young nice boy and telling me, you have no idea how important it is for you to spend your time with me, which made me feel a little bad about just leaving her. She kept telling me that she wanted to reward me and make me some dinner if I just came in, which I continued to decline. Finally, I told her I had to go, and she asked me if I knew anything about how to turn on her cell phone, as she just got her first cell phone very recently. I told her I did, and I could help her out before I left. She told me to wait yet again, and this time left for quite a while. I kept thinking I should just walk away, but part of me didn't want to be rude, especially since she lived right around the corner from my house, and possibly even knew my parents. My anxiety levels would spike as I got closer and closer in my head to convincing myself to just stand up and walk away. Then it would just dissipate and I'd tell myself, No, I can't just leave. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, she brought me her phone which was an Android. I had only had an iPhone 3G at the time and it was my first smartphone, so I was a little worried that I wouldn't know how it worked. I just held the power button down for a second and lo and behold, it booted right up. She asked me then if I knew how to check text messages. I found and opened up the messages app and there was only one number not saved as a contact in the app. She then pointed to it and said, That's him. That's my husband's number. Read me his text. I opened it up. She had received basically the same text over and over again. Just multiple variations on hello and please respond. She angrily said to me, Read them to me right now. I want to know what he said to me. I then tell her. They basically all just say hello with a question mark. She just reaffirmed in a stern voice. Read them to me. I started reading them. Hello? Hello? Please respond. She just has her eyes closed and she's nodding sometimes, commenting with things along the lines of. That jerk. He does miss me. Well, screw him. He had his chance. She then turned quickly from this crying distraught woman who was worried about her husband leaving her into an angry and spiteful person who felt like she was in the right. There was a couple of times when I stopped reading and I would ask if she wanted me to stop and she would just snap at me, keep reading, then I would continue. I started to feel like her husband was a crazy person with this many messages. I must have scrolled and read dozens of messages almost identical, spanning back days. My heart was racing. I felt like I was involved in something I shouldn't be involved in. I really wanted to go home, but every time I stopped, she would get really angry and tell me to keep going. That's when I came across the very first message that wasn't hello. Stop messaging me, you crazy woman. Leave me alone. I've reported you to the police and got a restraining order. If you come anywhere near my family, you will be arrested. My heart sank. That's when I realized all the messages I had been reading so far were being sent from her phone. I paused in shock and she again snapped at me. Keep reading. I told her I couldn't because it was getting very late and my parents had dinner for me. She again just said, Why don't you just come in for dinner? I'll make you something. You can let them know later you are helping your neighbor. They won't be mad, I promise. Only this time she was a mixture of angry and desperate. I told her they would be worried and wonder why I was gone for so long. She pleaded a couple more times for me to not leave her and she started crying as I stood up. Honestly, I felt really bad about it at the time. I rode my bike home as quickly as I could. My parents had just gotten home from work a little while ago and asked me where I was. I didn't tell them the truth because honestly, I was a little worried that they wouldn't let me hang around the neighborhood when they weren't home anymore. A few days later, I came home and there were three police cars out in front of her house. My heart sank. 
I asked my parents later that night if they knew what had happened. My dad just said, oh, there was just a break-in or something. I later asked one of my neighbors to see if I could get some more information about what happened. Apparently, one of my neighbors fell in love with a homeless woman after inviting her in for a shower and a place to stay. He got her some new clothes and a phone and was trying to help her get a job. Turns out the reason she was homeless was because she suffered from mental illness. He then kicked her out when she started having delusions of his kid from a previous marriage being her kid as well. Honestly, he sounds like a really crappy person. She began harassing him after this, so he left the house to his parents' house and then sent the kid to his ex-wife's house. Apparently, he was worried for his ex-wife and his kid's safety. He had every right to because shortly after he left, she broke a rear window of his house and then came in. She had been living in the house for nearly a week before a neighbor noticed the broken window and called the police. She apparently trashed the whole house by that point and was arrested. I almost didn't believe it, but I went behind the house and saw the broken window. I guess the guy broke his lease and moved out immediately because he was worried she would come back after getting out of jail. I don't know if she ever did try and come back, but I really hope they disclose this to the new tenants. Honestly, I still get pretty freaked out to this day. Who knows what would have happened if I went into that house. About five years ago, when I was 16, I was living in western Pennsylvania in a heavily forested area. On this particular night, I was home alone with my younger brother, while my mom was out at a baby shower. I was in the kitchen making dinner for myself when I heard a knocking on the front porch. This wasn't a common knock like someone might be waiting for me to open the door. It was more like a few loud taps close to one of the front windows. I paused and glanced around. From where I stood in the kitchen, I could see the front door and one of the front windows. All the lights on the ground floor were on, and with it being dark outside, all I could see in the windows was a reflection of the inside of my living room. I waited for a few moments, but when the sound didn't come again, I shrugged it off and continued concentrating on the stove. After maybe five minutes, long enough for me to forget about the sound, it repeated itself. This time from the front window at the far side of the house. Mark? I called out, thinking it might have been my brother. There was no response. I walked over to the front of the house and peered outside with my hands pressed to the side of my face, but I couldn't see anything. I turned as my brother came down the stairs. Did you just hear something from around back? He said. I held up a finger to indicate that we should pause and listen, and almost on cue, we heard footsteps calmly walking across the wooden floor of our wraparound porch, just outside the dining room wall. There's someone out there, I said quietly, more angry than scared. It was at this point that we should have locked all the doors and called out the window that we were calling the cops, but I was a stupid headstrong kid and pissed off that someone was messing with us. I remember my brother asking if the person outside was trying to distract us, but I was already at the gun cabinet. I should point out that I was raised with guns, and I knew how to properly handle one. I pulled out the 9mm from the drawer and loaded it. I'm going to scare him off, I told my brother. Lock the front door behind me. Before I could even give him a chance to argue, I was marching to the door with a gun in my hands. I threw open the door and stepped out into the porch. My brother then flicked on the outside lights, and right there, about eight feet in front of me, was a sickly thin guy wearing a hoodie with light blue eyes and a soul patch on his chin. He had been in the process of stepping onto the porch, but the moment he saw me he spun around and ran like a bat out of hell. I took off running a few yards after him, then stopped, pointed my gun in the air, and fired off a shot. That's right, fuck off! I cried out. I waited until he disappeared into the trees before turning around to face the house. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that for a few moments my heart stopped. I felt that momentary wave of ice water through my veins, and the painful thudding of my heart in my chest as it tried to correct its rhythm. There was at least eight other people standing around my porch, and a handful more scattered around the yard. They were mostly men, but there was also at least two women all dressed in dark jackets and hoodies, looking mostly like they were in their early 20s. None of them said anything. Instead, they all just stared at me, their hands mostly in their pockets, 
and I couldn't tell if any of them had weapons. Then they all just scattered. Some jogged away, but most of them just walked off in different directions out into the woods. I legitimately forgot for a handful of seconds that I was holding a gun, until I raised my hands to my face and felt its weight. I sprinted back to the front door and pounded on it until my brother let me back in. I had no idea what to tell him. I had just fired a gun up into the air and none of them had cried out or made any sound whatsoever. Had they had been drunk or something and were trying to pull a prank, they would have said something. They would have been like, Whoa, sorry man, wrong house, put down the gun. But all they did was just look at me, like I had just ruined their surprise attack. And more disappointed than scared, they all just wandered off. I had no idea what to make of it. My brother turned on all the lights in the house and called the cops, who to their credit arrived within 10 minutes and swept the perimeter. There were footprints everywhere, and they asked my brother and I numerous times if we had just had a party. I kept telling them a dozen or more people had just been loitering around our house in the darkness, but the cops didn't seem to take it that seriously. They asked if the strangers had threatened us, and I had to admit that they didn't in any direct way. They confiscated the handgun after I told them that I fired off a round, but they eventually returned it. I have no idea to this day what those people were doing that night outside of our house. My brother suspects that they were part of some kind of cult, and maybe have been setting up to perform some kind of ritual, and maybe that we were set to be human sacrifices. I thought it more likely they intended to break in and rob us, but saw the gun and bailed. That doesn't explain the silence though. None of them uttered so much as a sound as they looked at me and just, as if instructed by some signal, scattered all at once. I've read that during alleged UFO sightings, people can become hypnotized by lights that appear above them, and they wake up hours later in entirely new locations having no idea what happened or how they got there. I can't dismiss that kind of possibility. They all seem to be hypnotized. That group of people has never returned and I haven't even caught a glimpse of anyone I recognized from that night in town. We bought a dog not long after. I'm 20 years old, female, and this was the last time I willingly stayed in a room alone with a child. I used to babysit on the weekends when I was 15. Most of the families that I babysit for were nice, sophisticated families who had sweet children that I loved. However, the Cooper family were the exception. Mr. and Mrs. Cooper had two children, Michael, who was ten, and Antoinette, who was four. Michael was quiet, though misbehaved and crazy demented. Antoinette was loud, cheerful, and the complete opposite of her brother. She was so innocent. I truly adored Antoinette, yet I despised Michael. He was an absolute terror. I'd watch over the two children on Friday nights for three hours while their parents went on a date, meaning three awful hours of psychological, emotional, and physical torture from Psycho Michael. There were many times that I would catch Michael staring at me while I was sitting at the dining room table doing my homework. I'd tell him to quit it, but he wouldn't stop until I moved out of view. Michael was really cruel to his sister. He would push her down the stairs, pull the heads off her Barbie dolls, and cut up her clothes. Michael would also hit the cats with a sock full of quarters, one cat actually ended up dying from internal injuries. He would growl at the neighbor's dog on a good day and tape stuffed animals to windows with scissors sticking out of their heads on a really bad day. He was a horrible little kid to say the least, but the scariest part about babysitting the twerp was the night that he came for me. Let's keep in mind that I wasn't supposed to even be there that night, but Mr. and Mrs. Cooper called my mom and asked if I could babysit for them since their other arrangement had fallen through. My mom agreed without even asking me. I was supposed to babysit from 5 o'clock in the evening until 10 o'clock at night. It was storming out, so the television had no signal, and my cell phone didn't have any reception, and Antoinette was staying with her grandmother, leaving me alone with a psycho child for five whole hours. I'm glad to say that the first few hours went by pretty quickly and without incident. He was fed, bathed, and put to bed at around 8. Michael had fallen asleep the instant his head hit the pillow. I breathed a sigh of relief and lay down on the couch with headphones in, not knowing it would be a mistake. The music was loud enough to drown out any other sounds. I stared at the ceiling for a while because there was no use in trying to delve deep into the realm of social media. 
I drifted to sleep at some point only to be scared awake because of an intense pressure resting on my throat. Michael was standing over me with a wide smile, gripping the handle of a kitchen knife. I wasn't able to ask what he was doing due to the sudden fear that filled me. He pushed the blade harder and harder against my neck until I could feel a burning sensation. He laughed maniacally before running out of the room. I wiped the small amount of blood from my neck while searching the entire house only to panic when he was nowhere to be found. The sound of the cat's screeching caused a breath to hitch in my throat. I quickly grabbed the baseball bat from the linen closet and hurried up the stairs. My hand hesitantly grabbed the doorknob to Michael's bedroom. I pushed the door open which I still regret to this day. My screams of terror were drowned out by his laughter. Michael was sitting in the open doorway of his closet with the carcass of the cat lying in his lap. I really do wish I could say that the horror had ended there, but it didn't. No. That twisted boy chased after me, attempting to slice my back open with every step he took. The deranged psychopath managed to get close enough to plunge the knife into my shoulder. Needless to say, I ran out of the front door and didn't stop until I was hunched over trying to catch my breath a block away from the police station. I packed up my things a few months after that moved into an apartment with my now husband 1,000 miles away from the town that I grew up in. I had to move 1,000 miles away from Psycho Michael in order to feel safe, but even that made me crazier. I attended therapy for several years afterward. I couldn't sleep without the lights on because the image of him holding a dead cat had permanently seared itself into my mind. I was paranoid for months, afraid that he would jump out from behind a corner and yet I still harbored the idea of having my own children one day. Truth be told, I honestly did care about the Cooper kids, but after the injuries I suffered, physical and psychological, my parents and I had no other choice but to press charges, at the very least to pay for medical bills and counseling. Michael, being as young as he was, was committed to a psychiatric treatment and juvenile detention for nearly three to five years from what I heard, but... After all the legal processes were complete, I couldn't bring myself to digging any deeper as to not relive that memory. Looking back on the incident now makes me feel silly for even being scared of a ten-year-old. It's strange how life works sometimes. It's strange how I just froze there. I eventually realized that I don't want children, and I absolutely refuse to babysit for anyone. Babysitting wasn't the job that I had imagined having while I was a senior in high school. I was paid a decent rate by the hour for watching kids that only needed to have an adult around while their parents were out. I know exactly what you're thinking. Why would you willingly waste your time watching children when you could have been working retail or some other halfway decent job? Am I close? Well, as you can imagine, the majority of kids I've looked after were happy, normal children, but my sister's children... Let me get to that. Here's a little background just to help you better understand why I don't foresee myself having children anytime soon, if ever. I'm a male and a social outcast at that. I was 16 when my mom told me that I'd be babysitting for my older sister. Naturally, I shrugged it off as it were no big deal because, I mean, what's the worst that could happen, right? My sister needed to go out of town on a business trip for two days, which then caused my mom to decide that I was the right candidate for the job. I learned very quickly that kids are hungry literally every five minutes, and they have no respect for the babysitter, and they are totally out of control without their parents around. That was a bummer. Kids are perceived as sweet, innocent, and all-around pure, yet I have first-hand experience on just how truly creepy some kids can be. I had been around my nieces and nephews dozens of times before, so there wasn't any reason for me to think that they were a bit peculiar, aside from the fact that I walked in on Nat, short for Natalie, attempting to sacrifice her sister to the devil in order to bargain for immortality by shoving Lux's hand into a blender. Luckily, I was able to pry her away from the blender before she could turn it on. I had been watching them for less than 20 minutes when that incident occurred. Fast forward to this first afternoon, the kids were playing in the toy room, so I decided to watch television before doing my homework. I was in the middle of a funny movie when I cut the side of my neck with scissors. 
He drew a pentagram on the floor with ketchup, chanted something in a language that I didn't recognize, they probably made it up, and locked Jay in the basement. Tony was the good kid who explained that Mike was trying to summon a demon, someone that is close to the devil so that he could bargain Jay's soul for immortality. Mike angrily hissed at me when the plan didn't work. I swear to God, those freaking creepypastas they watch really don't help them. It was then that I learned that they had a crazy obsession with vampires. The need to be immortal and trying to draw blood from people is their way to fulfill the desire to be like the people in movies or books. These kids were actually trying to figure out ways that they could become immortal without having to stay so small for all of eternity. I thought that was a bit unhealthy. I still have no idea how the internet or horror movies, when their parents weren't looking, really activated this, but I'm honestly still scared of what could have happened. Nat was the eldest child. She was the bad influence on her siblings. She was the entire reason why everything went down on the second night. I was studying for a calculus test that I had the next day. The kids were supposed to be playing in the backyard, which was the mistake. All I really remember about studying is that I had been exhausted from chasing around those brats the night before because I ended up falling asleep at the kitchen table. I woke up sometime in the afternoon with my hands and feet tied to a metal pipe in the basement while my deranged nieces and nephews stood over me with a weird look in their eyes. I struggled for a good ten minutes to free myself from that stupid rope as they chanted some weird language again. I assumed that they were really trying to sacrifice me, however, I was relieved when I saw one of the cats knock a candle off the windowsill. The carpet and lengthy silk curtains immediately caught fire, which caused the kids to untie me. We rushed out of the house and to safety just in time to watch the house burn, literally to the ground. I stood motionless for what seemed like hours before eventually the police were called by the neighbors. I called my mom to come get the kids before being questioned by police for over three hours. The detective that was interrogating me surely was about to arrest me, but the fire department later ruled that the fire was an accident. My sister angrily barged into my room once she arrived home and informed me that I was no longer allowed to babysit her kids again and literally almost beat me senseless if it wasn't for my parents stopping her fury. I cried tears of joy at the news and never babysat again. I tried to explain the story to both the detectives and my family, though my nieces and nephews' stories all apparently corroborated against my own, and there was nothing I could do. Needless to say, I never visited their family again, both by being shunned and by choice. Natalie and the other kids all grew out of the vampire phase from what I heard once they hit junior high and acquired less creepy, less dangerous interests. I'm 28 years old now, incredibly far away from my family, married to the most amazing woman, yet I still refuse to think about having children. You never know what they're going to get into. I've had a lot of scary experiences, but I really think this one's the scariest. It was October 2015 and my sister was giving birth and I was babysitting her son who was nine at the time. The second night I was there, this happened. I put my nephew to bed in his room and then the dog in his cage in my sister's room, which I have to get past to get to his room. I then go downstairs and I get on YouTube on my computer. Well, about an hour later, I hear a door slam. I just assume it's my nephew going to the bathroom. I then hear another slam. I assume it's just him wanting privacy, and I then hear a third door slam yet again. I don't know how to explain it, but I kind of just knew that it wasn't my nephew. I kept hearing things being moved around, kind of like a dresser being moved across the floor. I then start to remember that this house was built not as a regular house back in the day. The attic is apparently connected to the house next door. All you have to do is go up the attic, walk a little, then lift the top and climb down the ladder. I had no choice but to go check on my nephew. I'm still hearing noises as I go up. I hear the dog in his cage going absolutely crazy, like he was trying to get out or something. I walk halfway up the stairs, then all of the noise just stops. I look in his room and he's sleeping with his door open. There was no way in hell I was going to walk past that pitch black room. In my mind, 
As long as he was safe, that's all that mattered. I then walked back downstairs. As soon as I walked back downstairs, I then hear footsteps running, followed by a door slam. Well, the next day I decided to tell my sister and brother-in-law. After I told them, what they said next to me chilled me to my core. Without any concern in the world, they went on to tell me that it was the spirit of our dead neighbor. Now, you're probably thinking, why didn't I just call the cops already? Well, I wasn't really thinking straight at the time. I was just way too scared, and I guess now it's a good thing that I didn't. A few weeks later, my mom had told my oldest niece, who was 16 at the time. She said that whenever she was in there, she always felt the feeling of being watched. To this day, I still don't know if I believe it was a ghost, or maybe an actual living intruder. All I know is that I for sure wasn't alone that night besides my nephew and I. Never again will I babysit there. Screw that. I think I was only 13 years old when this happened. I would be paid extra since I was going to be babysitting so many kids. I don't recall how many, but there were a lot. The reason why I was trusted with so many was because I knew them since my parents and their parents were all friends growing up, making us kind of form into a group. Now, I was the oldest out of every single kid, which was the reason I was in charge. Of course, it was going to be a long night, knowing that our parents would be at some bar far away until like around 2 in the morning and then stay at a hotel. For some background, I knew the kids and they knew me. I being the oldest, 13 at the time, and the youngest being around 4. There was definitely a little bit of an age gap. The majority of the kids were around 9 to 10. Anyway, the parents left and when they did, it was already around 4 in the afternoon. About two and a half hours later, I made dinner for them. We sat down and everyone ate their pasta. Because all the kids were together and they all knew each other, things got pretty crazy. I won't go into detail on exactly what went down, but some of the kids were just totally wild. I didn't really mind it though. It was pretty funny at the same time, but that's besides the point. So after a couple more hours, it was getting pretty late. I recall it being around 11.30 when kids were starting to settle down. I had to take care of some of the kids who injured themselves by doing some really stupid stuff that was really dangerous and I couldn't make it in time since I had to deal with some other problems as well. But I would consider myself a very caring and kind person because I always did what I needed to do to calm them down. So like I said, it was around 11.30 when they were starting to settle down and then not too long after they were starting to pass out. I brought and carried them upstairs and put half of them in one of the two kids' rooms. For the sake of keeping the real names out, basically we were at the house that belonged to the Abel's family. Ava and Dom were the kids in the family, making it their house. I put half the kids in Dom's room and the other half in Ava's room. They passed out very quickly after that. I went back downstairs to chill out and then listen to some music. After listening to music for a while, Ava comes downstairs and this is where things start to take a turn for the worst. I had to look because I was listening so loud that I couldn't even hear her calling my name. She then said in a really scared tone, Something keeps being thrown at the window in my room. I'm really scared. I was a little uneasy to be hearing this since this was such a weird thing to be happening at this time of night. I gave her a hug and I assured her that everything would be alright and that I would go check it out. The bedrooms were on the third floor, so this was especially weird since the room's windows were really high up. I went into Ava's room and I saw that the kids were sleeping. I guess no one else had heard the something hitting the window. I started to think that Ava was just making this up or something. I went back downstairs and I went to the couch where Ava was. I was a bit surprised to see that Ava wasn't there. This is when I then hear something from downstairs. It sounded like a muffled girl scream for help. I quickly ran down there to see Ava in the garage, then being dragged out of the garage by a dark figure. Someone had forgotten to close the garage door, so it was just open. I was so scared and I went into full on panic mode. I then went back inside to go grab a weapon or something that I can use in quick defense. I found this spear looking thing that's used for fires and also pushing wood in other areas. 
I picked it up, then ran outside to look for Ava. I soon saw Ava and this really dark figure, which was taking Ava in the backwoods. I then hit the dark figure in the back of the knee, practically stabbing the figure since it had a sharp edge on the side of it. The figure fell back and let out a yell of pain, which is when I grabbed Ava and then practically carried her back into the house. Very stupidly, I left the weapon I had outside. Since I was in a panic, I think that I just didn't have time to think about it since Ava was the main priority for me. I get back inside and close the garage door, hoping that was the end of it. I decided not to call the cops because I get really nervous when it comes to cops, so I just wanted to avoid that. I ran upstairs but try not to make too much noise to see if any of the kids were awake due to hearing the commotion from outside. There were only about two kids who were awake and they asked what was happening. I told them to just fall back asleep and that there was a situation that happened. They really wanted to know what, but I just told them I'll tell them in the morning. I really don't blame them. I think I would also want to know what was happening, especially after all that commotion. So anyway, I go back downstairs on the couch where Ava thankfully was this time, and she falls asleep with the comfort of me there the whole time. Fast forward to the morning. It's around 7.30 and I can hear some commotion from upstairs. The kids were up and playing. Ava had woke me up and she was really happy to see me there. I think I really made her feel safe. After that night, me and Ava's connection was a little bit different from before. As the story is becoming better, the final spook is yet to come, so get ready. I walked downstairs to see if anything had been stolen. I check and I didn't really see anything out of the ordinary. Well, nothing out of the ordinary, except for one thing. There happened to be a paper that was in the garage. It was taped to the sliding door, and I think that's why I paid attention to it. I started to read it, and it said one word. Revenge. I was really scared reading this because how the hell could someone have put this here? Then reality hit me that someone had to have come inside after the garage door had been closed, which is when I thought we were safe. I haven't shared this story with Ava because I don't want her to feel scared or threatened more than she probably already does. I do still have a few questions left unanswered though. Who did this? Why did they target this house specifically? And last but not least, did the intruder purposely try and take Ava out of everyone there? Why did he want her specifically? I know I'll probably never have my answers to these questions, but it's absolutely chilling to think about. I'm a female, and I'm 15 years old. This all started a couple months back when I got my very first job as a babysitter. I babysit on Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays. Keep that in mind. The people I babysit for don't even live that far away from my house. Their house is like a block away from me. So by now you've probably guessed that I walk to work. Now, I've always been a very cautious person, and also a paranoid one so keep that in mind too. The first time it happened was after a month of doing my job. One day I got done babysitting and I just walked to my friend's house that's a couple of blocks away from their house. So as I'm walking there, I hear someone behind me. I should also mention that I was snapchatting my friend to let her know how far away from the house I was. Anyways, I hear someone behind me so I turn around and see this guy on a bike right behind me. I didn't think too much about it, but I was keeping him in mind. I don't pay much attention to him and I keep snapchatting, just in case he tries something. I then turn to the left, and so does he. At this point I'm really aware now of what this guy's doing. I'm pretty sure he's following me. The guy looked tall as hell, and I'm only 5'5", five five, so again I make a turn, and so does he. By now I'm getting pretty panicked and I'm very much aware that this guy is following me. Anytime I slowed down, so would he. If I sped up, again, so did he. My friend's house comes into view and I speed walk over there with him telling me. I reach her front door and I start knocking and then I hear someone say, Hey, you better watch out. I'll get you. And I turn around and the guy was right behind me in front of her house. By this point, I'm very panicked, but I just keep knocking. And before she answers, this guy then pulls something out. At first, I didn't know what it was until I looked a little closer. 
and you guessed it. The guy literally pulled out his penis. Right as he does that, I pull my phone up and I catch him in the act, and my friend then opens the door. She lets me inside and she asks me why I'm shaking. I then show her the video and she tries calming me down. Fast forward a week later as I'm walking to my job and I see him yet again. My heart instantly drops and I just speed walk to the lady's house which I work for. He didn't really say anything. It was more like he was just watching me this time. This happened every single time that I would walk to work. But he wouldn't try anything because it would be daytime and most of the time someone was around. That all changed when they asked me to babysit their daughter at 10pm. I wasn't really going to walk to work alone so I asked the lady if she'd come pick me up instead. She did, and of course nothing happened. We then started doing that until I was calm enough to walk by myself to work. The following week, she asked me again to babysit at night, so I decided to take a knife with me just in case something happens, and I told my mom goodbye. I walked out in the really dark street, and the lights in that area weren't really good, which is why I was so scared to walk there in the first place. But anyways, I was walking to work, and I then hear a crunch behind me. My body then immediately tenses up. I knew someone was there, but I really dreaded thinking it was him. I decide not to look back, but instead just speed walk again. For a few minutes, I didn't even hear anything, but I then turn around, and there he fucking is. I don't say a single word, and just straight up bolt to their house. I tell them what happened, and she told me not to worry, and that he wouldn't do anything, then left me to babysit. Fast forward the second day and I walked to work and nothing happened this time. I was checking all my surroundings like a really crazy person, but no one was there. I then turned to knock on their door and from the corner of my eye, I see movement. I look and this guy's leaning out from behind trash cans and I, and I barely caught him. My heart started going crazy. I then knocked harder on the door and I saw him from the corner of my eyes just looking at me. He probably didn't even know I saw him but I did. Fast forward the next day and the walk to work wasn't really that much. I didn't see him but the walk back, that's a different story. I was walking back and I think it was about 12am. I texted my mom that I was on my way home and she told me to stop by the store. Now this store is like right across from our house so it wasn't really a big deal. This weird creep follows me, all the while making kids noises and saying really weird things like I love you over and over again. I just walk to the store and this guy literally stands right in front of the store. I get very angry at this point and I tell the cashier what's going on. He then looks at the guy for a minute and then tells him to leave. He says he wants to buy something, but the guy just tells him to leave. Well, he doesn't leave and he just keeps on standing there. So I then say to him, Why are you following me? He then says back, I'm not following you. And I said, Yeah, sure you're not. And I just stand in line and get my stuff and then walk out the door. The guy has the audacity to continue following me, all while making kissing sounds and then repeatedly saying, I love you. I die for you. I was just so fucking mad at this point that I snap back and say, Look, fuck off you creep. Leave me the fuck alone already, with a very angry tone. This doesn't even have an effect on this guy, and he just keeps repeating the same shit. I then tell him, Look, I know where you live, and I'll tell your mom about this, because I've actually seen him leave the apartments that are near the store. Anyways, he doesn't even care what I'm saying, and he's making eye contact with me the entire time. I just walk to my house, and I finally get there, but right before I get inside and slam the door, I then say to him, if you ever follow me again, you're gonna fucking regret it. He responds to this by laughing, then saying, oh yeah, what the hell are you gonna do? And proceeds to blow me a kiss. I then just walk inside, feeling very numb. I had just finally got home and I just started sobbing. My sister asked what was happening and I told her everything. She's extremely overprotective with me and she got really pissed off after I told her. She tells me that she's going to walk me to work and that if we see him, she's going to kill the guy. Obviously, I know that's not true, but it really made me feel better. All of this happened last week and today in a couple of hours, I have to babysit again. 
I know it doesn't seem like much, but I'm still really scared of what will happen to me in the future. I really don't even know what to do at this point. If any of you guys that are listening have some advice, please tell me what to do. I appreciate you taking the time to listen, and if anything else happens, I'll definitely give you guys an update. Be safe out there. In June of 1969, six-year-old Dennis Martin accompanied his family on a camping trip to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, a mountain range rising along the Tennessee-North Carolina border in the southeastern United States. The name Great Smoky Mountains comes from the natural fog that often hangs over the range, appearing as large smoke plumes from a distance. Interestingly, this fog is caused by chemicals emitted from the local flora, chemicals that have a high vapor pressure and easily form vapors at normal temperature and pressures. Yet even having heard the scientific explanation behind the phenomenon, seeing all that fog clinging to the hilltops is a very eerie sight indeed. Hailing from nearby Knoxville, Tennessee, the Martin family had a long-running tradition of celebrating Father's Day by taking camping trips to the Great Smoky Mountains. In 1969 would mark young Dennis's first trip into the woods in the company of his father, older brother, and grandpa. The group drove out to Cades Cove, an isolated valley located in the Tennessee section of the park, then hiked out towards Russell Field, where they set up camping and began preparing for their first night under the stars. The following morning, they set off for a place known as Spence Field, a picturesque highland meadow and popular camping spot which was bisected by the rolling hills and jagged mountain peaks of the Appalachian Trail. When the group arrived at Spence Field, Dennis and his older brother set off to explore the campsite and reportedly talked to many of the other campers who had pitched their tents nearby. This is how they got talking to a ragtag group made up of other campers' children who made fast friends with the Martin boys. Dennis' father was pleased to see his son getting along so well with the other kids, and having his sons occupied meant the adults could get on with the important task of assembling their four-man tent. Once the task was completed, Dennis was still playing with a group of other kids, and his father says he watched as the group gleefully took up hiding positions from which to playfully ambush a group of approaching adults. When the grown-ups entered the kids' make-believe kill zone, they all jumped out, growling and roaring like wild animals as they set upon their laughing parents. All but one. All but little Dennis. His father watched with growing concern as the seconds ticked by, and Dennis had yet to emerge from his hiding spot. Eventually, he couldn't bear it anymore, and after rising from his camping chair, Dennis's father marched off the spot where he had last seen his six-year-old son and began calling out his name. But what started out as stern, fatherly commands soon degenerated into terrified pleas, and as he continued to call out in desperation, the other families began to realize that something was terribly wrong. Once Dennis's grandpa knew he was missing, he set the group into action, sending one group two miles up the Appalachian Trail with his son, while he led another group back towards the Cades Cove Ranger Station, arriving there around 8.30pm that night. Thus began an extensive, well-publicized search and rescue operation, in which National Park Service personnel was supplemented by National Guard soldiers and even a unit of Green Berets. At the peak of the search operation, more than 1,400 people were operating in the few square miles around Spencefield, but not a single one found anything that could lead them to the missing boy. However, in the aftermath of the operation, the search efforts drew a great deal of criticism from search and rescue experts far and wide who said the large number of personnel involved potentially obscuring tracks and ground that was already difficult to track over due to heavy rain. Shockingly, a shoe print belonging to that of a child was actually found at one point, but the track was dismissed as belonging to one of the Boy Scouts that was helping with the search. Later, however, investigators kicked themselves when they found that the tracks were determined to have come from a child who was missing one shoe, which disappeared on the banks of a stream. Some suggesting it was possible that the tracks belonged to Martin, and this theory was supported when a discarded child-sized shoe and sock were found just three days later. Although search and rescue personnel continued their search for more than two weeks, 
scouring the hillsides night and day in continual shifts. No further clues to Martin's whereabouts were ever found. The Martin family was so understandably desperate for answers that they offered a $5,000 reward for any information that would reunite them with their beloved Dennis. This got the attention of a handful of so-called psychics, who some might argue sought to exploit the Martin family's grief and maybe cashing in if they guessed the right area of the Smokies to search. Surprisingly, none of these psychics ever proved to be of any help. Many years later in 1985, a man who had apparently been illegally collecting American ginseng in the park claimed to have come across the skeletal remains of a child while exploring the woods. The man said he should have reported the find, but was terrified of being prosecuted for his prohibited herbal hobby. Not only that, but he was also unable to point investigators in the direction of the site he'd found the bones in the first place. There have been many theories that have attempted to explain what happened to young Dennis Martin that day. Most detectives, both amateur and professional, believe that Dennis became disoriented whilst looking for a hiding place, maybe even forgetting his way back to camp when he emerged from it. Either way, Dennis then strayed further from the camp and could easily have fallen down one of the many steep slopes and ravines that dotted the area surrounding Spencefield. However, Dennis was wearing a bright red t-shirt when he went missing, not something that would be easy for search and rescue teams to miss. Dennis would have to be completely covered in foliage to remain undetected with that color of shirt, and despite it being feasible due to his small size, the likelihood of that is extremely low. Others are quick to remind us of the presence of black bears in the area, as well as copperhead vipers and feral pigs, all of which would have posed a considerable threat to six-year-old Martin. Park rangers told investigating police that an underweight bear had been caught in a boar trap in the Spencefield area just two weeks earlier. Although the bear was released safely, the incident suggested that it may have been struggling to find enough food, prompting to turn to a less familiar source of food. Yet however tragic and brutal the aforementioned theories are, Dennis's father believes something considerably more sinister. Based on the eyewitness account of one Harold Key, who says he heard a loud scream on the very same afternoon that Dennis disappeared, Dennis's dad firmly believed that his son was kidnapped by an opportunistic predator. Shortly after he heard the scream, Harold Key claimed to have seen a disheveled bearded man with wild unkempt hair fleeing through the woods in an apparent bid to remain undetected by the nearby campers. Harold's family went on to explain that they saw a flash of red on the figure's shoulders, which some believe was actually Dennis himself, slung over the shoulder of this mysterious figure as they carried him away. Harold later speculated that the man may have been a moonshiner, explaining his reluctance to be seen. Despite the report, FBI investigators ultimately dismissed it, saying that as much as Harold meant well, his account was frankly unreliable as his timeline of events were off. But one retired park ranger lamented the failure to properly follow up either the footprints or the sighting of the rough-looking man, arguing that as the location of the sighting was downhill from where Dennis disappeared, it was possible to cover that distance in the time frame, even carrying a child, but that the individual in question would have some impressive strength, stealth, and endurance. So if this is the case, who is this hairy mystery man? This bearded vagrant who was apparently capable of such an impressive physical feat, even if it was in the context of the despicable abduction of a child. Given the lack of investigation into his sighting or his tracks, it seems we might never know. But even if we did get to the bottom of the mystery of a man living in the Appalachian Mountains with a penchant for kidnapping children, I don't think the answers would bring us any solace. Maybe the closure would be worth it, especially for the family, but nightmares can be a high price to pay, and wondering what happened to young Dennis Martin can give even the most hardened true crime reader some very sleepless nights. So in 2012, my then-girlfriend and I went on a big year-long road trip through the States, working on farms along the way for room and board and ended our trip by driving across Canada, west to east, stopping back in Nova Scotia where we lived. At some point we got a puppy, and around the time we got to Alberta, with an extra mouth to feed, money was running out. Since I'm a carpenter, 
I decided to find a place to rent, and I would get a job for a few months before we kept going on our trip. We scrolled through Kijiji, the Canadian Craigslist, and eventually found an ad for a place. There was this one guy who lived in a very cool looking house and was only a short drive from where I had found a job at. He wanted someone to move in with him to help out with the bills. We started corresponding with him by email. I told him that I was going to work in the area and my girlfriend would be staying home with the puppy. Being desperate and having become accustomed to trusting strangers throughout this long trip, we agreed to send him a deposit and take the offer. We got to this place a few days later. It was in the middle of nowhere and there were no neighbors, but we had known that before. This guy looked to be about 30 to 35, small framed, and just looked like a regular working country dude. Except his expression was weird. It was like he was scared or something. He almost looked like he was ashamed of himself. He was fine with our dog being inside, though he had a dog that wasn't allowed inside. This struck me as weird since this is the cold Canadian North. Right away, he met us at the door, and I felt there was something off about him. It made me uneasy, especially since I would be going off to work every day, leaving my girlfriend alone with this creepy guy. But she didn't seem worried, and I didn't want to be controlling, so I let it go. The first night we were there, he wanted to have a few drinks with us. We obliged politely. He brought us a few cans of shitty watery beer, and meekly drank his while sitting across the kitchen table from us. We tried to relax the situation and asked him a few friendly questions about himself. His answers were brief and quiet. He seemed to want friendship, but also seemed completely unsure of how to get it. He went over a few rules he had. Number one was to stay out of his room, which was obviously fine. Number two was that we were not allowed to go into the basement kind of weird. And number three was to stay away from the barn. By this point, I could imagine the headlines, Nova Scotian couple found murdered, bound in barn. That night, I didn't sleep very much. I wasn't supposed to start work for a couple of days, so I just stayed up reading and playing with our pup. I heard his truck pull out of the driveway pretty early in the morning. I headed for the basement because I just had to know what was down there. It was pretty bare. Just a few washing and drying machines and some lawn chairs. But I opened a closet door and found a weird nurse costume that looked like it was for sexual purposes. A roll of duct tape, a set of handcuffs, a shotgun, and a box of shells. All sitting together on the same shelf. I woke up my girlfriend and explained that she no longer had any say in the matter and that we were leaving before he got home. We sent him a message after we left, lying, saying that one of our family members had gotten sick and we were moving back home. He never offered to return our money, and we had no more contact with him. I'm still waiting to see him in the news. My ex thinks that I worry too much, but her parents thanked me profusely. And I still wonder, what was inside that barn? Number 2 The following story is told from a female's point of view, narrated by special guest Darkness Prevails. I got married when I was 19, and my husband and I had no clue what to do with our new life together. We dropped out of college, and our studio apartment was too expensive, and we thought it was the ideal time to travel and have adventures before settling down. We came across a post on the internet from a man who was looking for workers on his horse ranch. He would provide all meals and lodging in exchange for labor around the ranch. It looked like just the solution for us. He claimed to be very knowledgeable in trades and would teach us to build machinery, woodworking, welding. We actually did learn to weld, which is pretty cool, etc. The pictures were beautiful. The log cabin he built was spacious and we would have a nice big bedroom. There were lots of other people in the photos, and in our correspondence with him, he always mentioned other people and referred to himself as we. He advertises on multiple platforms and everything looked really legit. We booked our flight. There was nobody else there. He was in his 60s, but mentally and physically very fit. One of the first things he said to us was, 
I never judge people based on their past. Do you believe people can change? I sure do. It seemed harmless enough. He took us grocery shopping and told us to pick whatever we wanted. We immediately got the vibe that his kindness was forced and that he was being over generous. I'm going to get right into listing the weird stuff we noticed. He built the house himself and his bedroom had a door to the only upstairs bathroom, which he didn't lock from the inside. He would invite us into his room and on his table was an old video camera with about 30 little tapes strewn about. He would always talk about how much he loved the Japanese, how he specifically marketed toward them and had a few Japanese ladies in the past. He often brought up people who had stayed with them before and all of them had left suddenly and maybe unexpectedly. One day he told us to get in the truck because we were going into the city. We were way out in the country, so it was a long ride, but he was really excited about going. He asked us to walk around and ask young people to come with us and work on the ranch. This made us super uncomfortable. We are introverts, and it just felt very odd to approach people and ask them to get in the truck. He got upset by our disapproval, so we got out and pretended to look for people to talk to. He went to talk to people on his own. As the days went on, his welcoming nature began to give away to a very temperamental and aggressive one. I didn't really find him creepy, but intolerable. I didn't like him at all. He seemed extremely socially inept and said inappropriate things. It was also extremely apparent that he did not view women as equal or anywhere near equal to men. He had had military training and was a big, strong man, cunning, always thinking. Now, our parents never wanted us to go. They realized it to be a potentially dangerous situation, but we thought we had done our due diligence. However, we never even thought to Google this guy's name. I get an email from my mom one day, freaking out and telling me to do a Google search, then get on the next plane home. A quick search showed us his arrest record, strangling and sexually assaulting a young woman, followed by headlines reading, do not go to this horse ranch. This man is dangerous. We were thoroughly creeped out and booked a flight home. We were then presented with the dilemma of how to tell a potentially dangerous man that we wanted to leave. I forgot to mention that he would tell us daily about how we could live there permanently and start a family. He would fantasize about Christmases with our future children and raising them on the ranch. We thought it was established that this was a very temporary thing and we had families back home who missed us. This is the weirdest part for me. I made up a lie about an emergency back home and when I told him, it was like he could see right through me. I'm convinced that he not only knew I was lying, but he knew I was going to lie about needing to leave before I ever opened my mouth. This look came over him that I have never seen on a person before. He was angry, but hiding it. He was hiding so many thoughts and emotions that I couldn't tell if I should be frightened or relieved. Before I finished my sentence, he said, when do you need to go to the airport? Monotone. I told him right now. He took us and put on his friendliest personality and told us that if we ever wanted to come back, he would buy our tickets. We said we'd be in touch. Just recently, I googled his name again and discovered a page, a forum, for people who had gone to his ranch, mostly couples like us with eerily similar experiences. They spoke about how he says not to judge people on their past, the grocery store, the bathroom, and how they heard him listening behind his door during their midnight bathroom trips, the videotapes, and how they watched them and saw young Japanese girls flexing their arms. Looking through his search history and seeing nothing but Japanese pornography, they talk about how he would make rude remarks to the girlfriends and about creepy rituals in the woods, which we experienced. It was like a full moon ritual inside a circle drawn on the ground. They spoke about being driven to the city and asked to jump out when thin young ladies walked by and tell them to come back to the ranch. I could go on and on. He is still operational. This forum I found was aimed at gathering stories and preventing future visitors to the ranch. The police do not have enough evidence to convict him of anything. I know I left a lot of creepy deeds out. I didn't want this to be too long, and I'm not a great storyteller. I'm unsure whether it'd be appropriate to name the man or the ranch, but the blog where all the others have written about their encounters is probably much creepier than my story. We got away with much less weirdness because I don't believe I was his type and he may have feared my husband. If anyone is interested, 
I may be able to give a few hints so it can be found. Number 1 I graduated high school almost a year ago. I really had no urge to attend college or military and basically got stuck in my boring hometown for months, where I slowly became dependent on Xanax and booze and was destined to repeat the cycle of white trash that my parents had set up for me and their parents before and so on. I knew I had to leave my hometown, so I decided to sign up for a website you may have heard of called www.oof.com Worldwide Opportunities in Organic Farming. You pay a small fee and they tell you about available organic farming operations that will feed you and allow you to stay with them in return for a certain amount of work around the farm. The place I decided to commit to was a Hare Krishna community in the Deep South. I got there and my car almost immediately broke down. It was a 30-year-old Chevy Blazer I bought on Craigslist for about $500. I later found out that it was beyond repair by this point. The closest town was about 20 miles away, so I found myself stranded, surrounded by the most unbearable hipsters. To be more specific, I would say about a third of the population of this community were either first or second generation Indian immigrants living near the temple for religious reasons. Another demographic were aging hipsters also there for spiritual purposes, but also running the small-scale organic farm located on the property. Everyone else, however, self-absorbed, condescending, right out of college but vapid as shit hipsters. I basically kept to myself, but occasionally was forced into conversations about vibrating crystals and their three-year spiritual journey no doubt being funded by their parents. I had been there for weeks and was desperate for a real conversation. And then Michael showed up. I had heard stories about Michael. A couple of days before I showed up, he had left to retrieve an impounded car in a large city about an hour away. Everyone said he was lazy and insane and would spend hours in his room doing yoga instead of coming down and working with the rest of us. He showed up late in the evening, going on about how he was really going to get involved with the farming and how he was going to throw himself into the Krishna consciousness. He was in his early 30s and looked like a balding Hasidic Jew, his unwashed sideburns curled. He spoke like a stoner cartoon character, his sentences always punctuated with and, uh, or, and like giving his utterly fried brain time to figure out what the others wanted to hear. He reminded me of the many friends I had left back home. We became fast friends, as he was the only person there who didn't give me the urge to bite my fingers off when he spoke. We were both from Texas, so we talked about the loony conservative teachers we had in high school, football, and of course, drugs. Every now and then, he would bring up subjects that really threw me off, he wasn't able to get his car out of the impound garage, so he schemed the best way to break it out. These plans involved firearms, pipe bombs, and telepathy. He told me he came to the Hare Krishna temple to befriend some of the gurus and learn Reiki meditation, a form of meditation used to control the minds and bodies of other people. He told me he believed he had used Reiki once to seduce a woman at a party. This is when I understood his reputation. I simply nodded and laughed occasionally when he went off on these rants. I knew that one day I would reach a saturation point for his absurdity, but I could probably endure it for a week more. A couple of days later, we were eating lunch with one of the gurus. I was telling Michael about my trip to the giant field where the Branch Davidian used to be. He wasn't sure what the Branch Davidian was, so I explained to him about Waco, David Korsh, and the botched siege operation by the FBI and ATF that led to the death of 76 Davidians and 4 ATF agents. He was enraged upon hearing this. Like, the government is always trying to silence people preaching the truth, man. Like, that's so fucked up. I wanted to explain to him that David Korsh was a sociopathic cult leader interested in power and nothing else, but he wasn't having it. 
Now I was getting angry. He was throwing a tantrum about a subject I had just explained to him, and now he was telling me that I'm wrong and that Korsh was a martyr. That's when I saw the truly insane Michael. He was spitting, red as a beet, pacing back and forth. I left the table and got back to work, but he followed me. After half an hour of this absurd argument, I couldn't handle it anymore. I'm not having this conversation with a fucking lunatic, Michael. How can I expect logic from you? You came here to get superpowers. The look in his eyes changed from anger to hatred. He got real still and then came at me. Michael was a big guy, much bigger than me. He lunged at me and I ran. As I ran, I went through my pocket, praying that I had grabbed my knife before I left my cabin. I know it sounds ridiculous, but you don't walk around my old neighborhood without some sort of protection. Plus, it was a pretty useful tool on the farm. Luckily, I had grabbed it. I turned around and he saw it. He stopped and contemplated for about three seconds. He then turned around and finished his lunch. The next day, I pulled the temple president aside and explained to him what happened and that we should probably get rid of him. It didn't take much convincing. No one really cared for him and he wasn't much help on the farm. I felt kind of bad snitching on the guy. He was in a pretty desperate situation. He had no car, no money, and I can't imagine he had many friends. The temple president also informed me that he had been an alcoholic for 10 years and came here to get sober. I found it very strange that he never told me this. Later that day, I saw through my window someone drive up and hand him several suitcases for him to pack what little he had. I saw them both drive off to God knows where. Weeks went by and the whole encounter kind of faded from my conscience. Late one night, I got a text. Hey, this is Michael. We can get my car out for like $280. Wanna go traveling? I never responded. I'm not sure how he got my number, but I figured he looked me up on Facebook or something. A few nights later, I was in the temple office using the Wi-Fi to send some emails. I was making my walk back to my cabin, and from the pitch black, I could hear a lot of loud banging coming from the barn. I remember thinking it must be an animal, but also thinking that it must be a pretty big one to make that much noise. I entered my cabin. The actual door to the cabin doesn't have a lock, but my bedroom door did, so I used that one. I was pretty unsettled by the banging, but I figured my imagination was getting the best of me. Later that night, I woke up needing to take a piss. The cabin didn't have a bathroom, but we did have a shared outhouse. I didn't feel like putting on shoes and walking around in the dark, so I figured I would just piss in the sink. I know it's gross but I'm the only one who uses that kitchen. I opened my bedroom door and nearly pissed myself right there. Michael, completely naked, was crouching in the corner of my kitchen, facing the wall. I made a noise I wasn't aware I could make, something you would hear Shaggy make on Scooby-Doo. The noise alerted Michael to my entrance. All he did was glare at me and shake his whole body. I slammed my door and locked it almost immediately. I knew what he was trying to do. He was trying to pacify me with Reiki meditation. I called 911. I didn't open my door or even approach it until I saw the red and blue lights outside my window. Michael wasn't there when they arrived. My guess is he ran deep into the woods that surrounded the farm. I explained to the police Michael's story and what happened that night. There wasn't much they could do since no one seemed to know anything about Michael. I didn't even know his last name. I had to leave the farm shortly after. Calling the police was really frowned upon since I believe many of the old hippies thought they were still avoiding the draft. I didn't mind leaving either. I couldn't sleep knowing Michael might still be out there in those woods angrier than he was before. I stayed up for almost three days while I waited for my friend to come pick me up. The story I'm about to tell is not as scary as it is sad, but don't be fooled. 
There were many moments during this time that I was scared out of my mind. Although I'm here to put some fear into readers, it's also a great opportunity to educate everyone on the dangers related to a common milady. So, turn out the lights and get comfortable. Here comes my scary tale of the nicest, but creepiest roommate I've ever had. Upon graduating high school, my parents hit me with the ultimatum, you're a man now, it's time you start paying us rent or move out and get your own place. Heck, I wasn't about to pay my folks to live with them, so the hunt for an apartment started immediately. Fortunately, I had a job for a couple of years, so I had some money saved up. I think my parents thought I would choose to stay at home and they'd be able to get a piece of it, but I've been looking for an excuse to get away from them and they gave it to me. It wasn't long before I found a place with a friend of mine riding his couch. This wasn't my long-term plan, of course, but it gave me a chance to get away from my parents. Within that month, I found a guy from work who had just been forced to kick his roommate out of their place for not paying as part of the rent. This dude was really cool and possibly the kindest guy I'd ever met, but he wasn't a pushover. We talked about each of our predicaments and decided I would take his former roommate's place, and it's where I would stay until just recently. We got along great, probably because we were a lot alike, and it also helped we work different shifts. Our days off were spent on the couch playing Halo and throwing down many bottles of beer. Drug tests at work prevented us from enjoying things of an herbal variety, but we managed to have a good time anyway. Nothing out of the ordinary happened for the first few months, but one night, I got a shock of a lifetime. I had crashed out early one night after working a 12-hour shift, the third of that week. I'm not sure what the time was, but at some point, a loud banging at my door drew me from my sleep. In a slow and groggy state, I rolled over to see what had caused it. That's when I came eye to eye with my roommate. I was so shocked I could have jumped out of my skin. After taking a second to catch my breath, I yelled at him. Dude, what? But the reaction I expected never came. Turning on my overhead lamp, I still received no feedback. Utterly confused, I walked up to him and stared directly at his face. He just looked ahead, standing like a statue, saying nothing. This is when I realized that he must be sleepwalking. Although I considered waking him up, I seemed to have remembered that you weren't supposed to do it, so I slowly turned him around and walked him back to his room. When we got there, I told him to go to bed and believe it or not, he did. Very pleased with myself and still horribly tired, I went back to my room and locked the door. The rest of the night was happily uneventful. The next time I saw him, which was about two days later, I timidly mentioned it to him. I was unsure if he was even aware he did it and I didn't want to embarrass him. To my relief, he was well aware of his condition. <laughs> yeah man, uh, it's something I've been doing since I was a kid. Like most things in his life, he was able to laugh it off. He did, however, apologize for scaring me and assured me that I handled it the right way. I more than likely wouldn't have been able to wake him up anyway. In the future, he would be sure to lock his bedroom door and suggested I do the same. There was no guarantee it would keep him in or out, but it was worth a shot. I'd had no other run-ins with my zombie roomie for another four months, and when I did, I handled it the same way as I had before. After thinking about it for a while, it seemed stupid to get mad about the situation. It wasn't something he could control. Besides, there were certain protocols I could take to keep him out of my room at night, and once I did, I never received another nocturnal visit again. Sadly, by the end of that year, it would cease to be a worry in either of our lives. On December 3rd, I had only just returned from a three-day vacation a vacation my boss had forced me to take because I was grossly over accrued on my vacation time. I didn't tell him, but I was hoping to combine that time with the other three days I had coming so I could drink all the way through the holidays till January 3rd. Since my plans had been ruined, my mood was on the bad side. I was vegging out on the couch when I got a phone call from work. The moment I saw the number on my phone, it put me in an even worse mood, but I decided to answer it in case it was my roommate that was the one calling. Is your roommate there? He hasn't shown up for work today. Unfortunately, it was my boss. I was quick to remind him in the kindest way possible, of course, that 
I was not his mother and I had not seen him in a few days. My boss asked me to check his room and see if he was still sleeping, and I did because he was my boss but he was nowhere to be seen. His bed was still messed up which was strange, his anal retentive nature would never let him leave the house without making it. I promised my boss I'd call him if I heard from him and I hung up. As soon as I hung up I called my roomie but got no answer. Doing the only thing I could, I left a message and went on with my day. There was still no return calls that evening. It really was unlike him to drop off the map like this, but he must have had his reasons. The next morning I checked in on his room to see what time he'd finally came back, but everything still looked as it had the day before. It was definitely a head scratcher. This type of behavior was very unlike him. You never know though. I'd only known him a couple of years, maybe he had a dark side I'd never seen. Shortly before I left the apartment for work, my phone rang. I checked the caller ID. It was a number I didn't recognize, but then an idea hit me. He must have lost his phone. And I answered it, trying not to laugh at him. Is this Anthony Curtis? The voice on the other end was not who I expected. I said yes, and his next question was if I was a friend of my roommate and I answered yes once again. Before he could ask me another question, I asked him one. Who are you and what do you want? His answer threw me for a loop. I'm sorry, Mr. Curtis. My name is Detective Jones with Littleton Police Department. I'm afraid your roommate, Daniel Grant, has been in an auto accident, and I regret to inform you he passed away at the hospital in the early hours of December 3rd. All I could say back to him was, What? Shock could not begin to describe what I felt that moment. I guess I had gone silent because at some point I heard him saying, Hello, are you still there? After I took a deep, jagged breath, I was finally ready to answer him. Yeah. I'm here. What happened? Where did this occur? I was full of questions. He should have been in his room at that time sleeping, not in public. I continued to ask the cop questions. All we know at this time, sir, was that he was involved in a single car crash. He collided with a power pole as he ran off the road. His next series of questions would begin to unravel the mystery. Are you aware of any reason why Mr. Grant should have been on the road that time of night? I told him, oh, That's the strange thing. He should have been home sleeping. He had work that afternoon, he had never went out at night regardless. Well, it was strange that he was driving only wearing his boxers. That's when the whole thing clicked into place. I think I understand now, detective. He was a sleepwalker. He must have been driving in his sleep. Our discussion continued for a few minutes longer and then I made the terrible call to his parents to notify them of the accident. They drove into town from Pueblo the next day. The arrangements were made to return his body to Pueblo and the date and time of the funeral was set for three days later. Just to show how loved he was by everyone who knew him, our supervisors halted all work for that day to allow everyone to attend the funeral. I'm not a fan of funerals overall, but this was one I would never have dreamed of missing. Sending my best friend off right was the least I could do for him. The complete facts of the story were soon released and it seemed to have played out just as I feared. Danny had sleepwalked his way out of his locked bedroom door, out to his car and down the road. I had no idea sleepwalking could go this far, but after a discussion with my doctor, I learned how serious the condition could become. Despite the fact neither of us had any idea of how dangerous his sleepwalking could be, I can't help but feel a small amount of guilt in relation to his death. Maybe if we had done some research, we could have put some safeguards into place. But honestly, how safe would a pair of two 20-year-olds really have been? One of us probably would have passed out after a long night of video games and drinking and left the doors unlocked. The fact is, Danny's death was a freak accident, plain and simple. I stayed in our apartment for a couple of years more and just recently decided to let it go once my girlfriend and I found a house to rent together. I guess I stayed around so long without finding another roommate because it would have made his death more real. 
My girlfriend and I would often do the same things Danny and I did on my days off, and it was almost as fun as the old days, but in the end, I realized as long as I stayed in that apartment, I would never truly be able to accept he was gone. So last month, the decision was made to pass the place on to another pair of young guys from work. They had been having a hard time finding a place to rent, and since I'd been in their position not that long ago, it was the right thing to do. I truly hope they have as much fun in that place as Danny and I did, and that their friendship doesn't end in such a tragic way as ours. <laughs> 